Hello, John. Is my speaker working? Your speaker is working. Your microphone is working great. Good. Thank you. My yeah. wife tells me I yell. I'll try not to do that. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm talking to you from a long distance away. Where are you? South Carolina. Oh, yeah. All right. What's the temperature there today? It was about 55 today, but it's supposed to be about 68 on Wednesday. We're going to take the, I'll, I'll be, I've got the motor put back in the TD, but I've still got some tune-ups to do, so I'll be driving the MGA. Very nice. Yeah, well, today it was um, pushing 34 here. <laughs> it's actually warmer when it's like minus four because you don't have all that moisture to suck the heat out of you. I mean, it's really cold when it's minus four but it's dry, right? yeah. dry heat, wet heat, stuff like that. But today it just seemed, I had to go out with a snowblower today. <laughs> and, uh, you know, when I, was, when I was stationed in Greenland, <laughs> I would go back to the weather forecasts in Minnesota and Montana to see cold weather. Yeah. So this is Dick Fletterer. I'm in Williamsburg, Virginia. I'm representing the Historical Williamsburg MG Touring Society. Hey, great. We have about uh, 25 members. Uh, I have to have a, have to have a, uh, a, a 55 TF 1500. Just spent about six months getting the charging system up to snuff, including a, a digit an electronic uh, control box and a sure. control complete uh, rebuild of my generator, original generator. Looking forward, to learning, looking forward to learning about SU carburetors, hoping I never use it. It's, it's going to be a real, it's going to be a really brief course tonight. So, well, it's gone 701. So I'm uh, just a minute here. I got to get all my stuff into place. And uh, okay, here we go. So it's 7.01, so welcome to the Monday night Zoom uh, technical session. We've got 138 people on right now. So this, this is how it works. Everybody's on mute. Matter of fact, I'm gonna mute all right now. Not because I don't like it, but there's always background noise. So here we go. I'm gonna mute everybody again and see if that works again. But people can unmute themselves. So um, you, can, you can look at what's going on either in speaker view or in gallery view. So in speaker view, you get all, a whole screen. Right now, it would be me. Or you can click on gallery view, and then everyone is a postage stamp size. And then you have to use the arrow on your screen and click, click, click over if you want to see what's going on. I keep it on gallery view because uh, I like to see all the different faces that are on here and so forth. When you start to speak, um, then, then you'll come up on the front screen. Um, so that will all work out. Post your questions in chat. Chat's on the bottom, on the bottom of, of the screen. There's a toolbar down there. And you can use chat to ask questions over on the right-hand side. Um, when I'll call on you uh, one after another, and when I call on you, you can unmute yourself then. There's two ways to do that. One is to unmute yourself on the bottom toolbar and click unmute. The other way is just press your space bar. It's kind of cool. Just press the space bar and, and you will stay unmuted. In other words, we can hear you until you release that, that space bar again. And after I'm done with each question, I always hit mute all, not because I don't like you, but there's always some background noise. When we're talking, when I'm answering a question and uh, I call on someone, um, I'll ask you where you're from and stuff like that. And then we'll answer the question. And if somebody else has something to add or has a question that's a, 
uh, really connected with that or something, just unmute yourself and talk. That's okay. You know, I, I, we can't have a dozen people doing that all at the same time, obviously, but it's worked out really well for us so far. So I want to make a couple of notes tonight. These are from emails that I've had over the past week. One, um, one MGB owner said, what's the name of the good rack boots? So Napa sells a rack boot for a Ford. Go figure. But anyway, it fits the MGB perfectly. It's phenomenally more expensive than the MGB rack boots are from anybody, but um, that's a NAPA part number 269-1507. 269-1507. It's, uh, I know they're 30 bucks each or something, but they just last forever. So it's, it's a, it, it, even at that price, it's a bargain. Uh, Bob Gray, we had a, a couple of, um, since our last Monday's seminar, I've had a couple of club seminars. Bob Gray, I think maybe from Pennsylvania, we're talking about tires and, and, and he went to buy some tires for his car and he said, I can't find wire for wire wheels. He said, I can't find tubeless tires. Nobody can find tubeless tires, they're not made anymore. So there's a ridge on the inside of, of tires and that ridge wreaks havoc with the tube so that's why you buy the thickest tube you can possibly find. They're often uh, called radial tubes, um, but get the thickest tube that you can find and put that inside there in a motorcycle shop is a great place to have your, your wire wheel fitted. Let I me mean, have the tire and tube and rubber band and so forth fitted to your wire wheel because they, they do that all day long. I've been corresponding with a guy with a 60, um, American spec, um, uh, 62 through 67 MGB, and he got sick of his pressure switch. He said, I want my brake lights to go on when I think about touching the brake pedal. And with a pressure switch, your brake lights don't illuminate until obviously you've got your foot on the pedal and you're beginning, you're beginning to apply some pressure. Um, so he was going to take a pedal box from a 68 through 74 and see if he could make it work. He's had some success. In the meantime, I heard from Roger Parker, who does the um, um, technical for the MG Owners Club out of England. And there, they didn't have a mechanical switch on MGBs for brakes until 1978. Everything prior to that was a pressure switch. So they've got a real problem over there. Uh, anyway, just I'm, I'm waiting to find out if, if this fella had a, a, a good success putting a, a, a standard brake light switch or some kind of switch into a pedal box cover, his pedal box cover. Okay, let's, let's do the numbers here. Um, I, what a change, what a change. It used to be that when we sent out mailers, and our mailing list swelled at one point, maybe to 5,000, 5,500. We'd have to have the envelopes printed, all the, all the contents printed. We had them folded, but we'd have a, a weekend at the house, get a bunch of videos, four kids, Caroline, myself, and we would collate stuff, seal, address, stamp, and stack all these envelopes. And they were, I don't remember what the USPS postage was at the end of doing those. It's solid 45 cents. Last night, I sent out a mailer on constant contact. I sent out, uh, let me look here, 4,921 with a click, with a click of my finger. It is unbelievable how nice that is. So it, I get good response off that. We've got a 34% open rate and a 6% click rate. I had a lot of the clubs in there last night. And I got no spam complaints this time. You know, you sent out 5,000 emails and even though people have signed up by themselves, somebody says, I, uh, this is spam. So they, they complain, you get too many spam complaints and constant contact will drop you, of course. But I didn't get those, any, uh, not this time and not the last time. So that's really nice. 
Facebook, if you're on Facebook, you can, you can go onto the group University Motors. And right now that's got 3,327 people uh, who look on Facebook from time to time at the page. The um, YouTube subscriptions are greater. Those are 20,172. And I'm waiting on YouTube views. We're just about ready to cross over right now as of an hour ago when I wrote down the number. It was 8,942,664 views. I'm waiting for it to go over 9 million. That's like Britney Spears in a good week, you know? Gosh. So I've got to remind everybody, please, to, to consider going on my website and going up here to the uh, PayPal, PayPal button on my website. This is my crude, rude attempt to help afford my retirement. So if you have gained some knowledge or you've been entertained, please go to my, pay, my, my website, universitymotorsltd.com and press the PayPal button and make some kind of, some kind of contribution. It is, I'm not a 501c3, it is not tax deductible, but I, I thank you very, very, very much uh, for doing that. And since our last meeting, let me, let me just read out the names of the people who contributed. Uh, it's very kind. Uh, Mike Skokos, Bob Gibbs, Andrew Lubin from Morrisville, Pennsylvania, and I bought his book. John Bender from Pittsburgh, Paul Murphy, Doug Clark from the Chicagoland Club, Tom Banks, Crystal Johnson. Crystal, thank you. Crystal's in Texas. She may unmute herself tonight and tell us what it's like there. I've got a friend that lives in Houston. It's horrible. Um, or was horrible. Maybe probably still is. Quentin Reeder from Grand Rapids. Felix Negron from Lares, Puerto Rico. James Howard from Clifton, Virginia. Bobo Tanner from Nashville, Tennessee. Don Bueller. Otmar Renkin from Elgin, South Carolina. Mark Goldfarb from Bay Village, Ohio. Glenn Craig from Erie, PA. Jim Astor from Altoona, Pennsylvania. Gary Maves. Rutgar Guzen from the Netherlands. Les Bengtson from Phoenix, Arizona. Mike Ellis from Glenig, Maryland. And Liz Tenike from Virginia or Maryland. I think it's Virginia. So anyway, thank you all, all for supporting me and everything. It's, it's uh, very, very kind. Now I'm gonna try, I haven't done this for a long time. I'm gonna try to hit share screen and we're gonna talk about SUs for just, just brief, just brief. And I'm hoping that my cursor, I'm hoping that my, my cursor works through all this. So let me find share screen. Let me go to here. Uh, okay, well, okay. So it's not uh, not working yet. Let's see. It says um, here we go. Okay, from the beginning. From the beginning. Come on, here we go. SU carburetors. And I've got a little screen here on my right hand side, but I'm going to get out of him. So anyway, SU carburetors. So the simplest carburetor in the whole world. Can you see this? Can you see? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. So the simplest carburetor in the whole world is this. It's a tube with a restriction. See the restriction here. It's a smaller diameter. And the whole function of a carburetor is to evaporate gasoline. That's its function. It turns liquid into gas by evaporation. And it does that uh, through the movement of air and the difference, the difference in pressure. So this carburetor is perfect if you've got a constant speed and a constant load. The air is going through the carburetor. It hits this narrow spot here. There's less pressure at this point than there is pressure pushing on the fuel in the float bowl over here. And the float bowl is just like the back of your toilet. It's just got a valve in it and a pressure line and it fills up and it keeps gasoline at, at the jet. So this is perfect, constant speed, constant load. You don't need anything more than just this for a carburetor, okay? Straightforward enough. But 
we've got to change the RPM. You know, we go from idle all, all the way up to 80, 90 miles an hour. So we've got to have a throttle disc in here. So that's the first moving part in an SU. It's just the throttle disc. Easy, open, close it, lets more or less air through. All the engine wants to do is run, run, run. The thing that's preventing it from running is that throttle disc. Uh, it's, it's, it's just it can't get enough air fuel in to make it run as fast as it wants to run. The more you open the throttle disc, faster it runs. Easy, easy schmeasy. But, well, we, we can, uh, let's see. Yeah, I can go back. The problem, the problem with this is that it works only in a very uh, small range of RPM and or load. It works in your, in your lawnmower. This is the, the, the carburetor in your lawnmower or my snowblower today. But we've got lots of different considerations. So we've got to control the mixture. Other carburetors, like a downdraft Weber, has one jet on the 32 millimeter choke. And then once you get to a certain point, if it's a progressive carburetor, another, another jet opens up. And it's designed to, to mix enough gasoline with the air. You just can't make one carburetor that's going to work for a 700 idle in a 90 mile an hour uh, going up a slight incline. It just, you can't, can't do it. But we do. SUs do, and they do it by allowing this piston to move up and down. The piston follows the airflow. So the more air that's going through here, the higher the piston floats because of some holes and some vacuum that gets up, up above the top of the piston. There's a spring in here to put some force on it. Earlier carburetors, beautiful T-type TC carburetors have got brass air pistons terribly expensive to make. That's why they started making them out of aluminum and putting the spring in there. Anyway, we've got a jet. We've got a, our, we've got a jet and a tapered needle. So the higher, the higher the air piston moves, the farther this needle pulls out of the jet and the larger the effective orifice. The whole point being trying to maintain that 14 to one mixture of air to fuel and it works great it really works great if i mean come on i mean if everything else is working okay and it's not all filthy inside the needle isn't bent the stuff isn't worn out but so we've got that under co control now we can change the speed and we can keep the mixture correct at any given speed or load but what about acceleration right at acceleration you've got to dump a whole lot of extra gasoline into the airflow, just the way it is. Um, uh, Weber carburetor has got a diaphragm and it shoots, I mean, it shoots just a stream of gasoline into the intake manifold to enrich in the mixture at acceleration. Instead of a pump on our carburetors, Instead, we've got a damper, this damper that I, I've only got labeled up here, the AUC8113 that screws in the top, and that sits in the dash pot, and in the dash pot is oil. At the bottom of the damper is a, is a hydraulic valve that allows the piston to fall effortlessly, just falls almost at normal speed. But when you go to push it up, oh my gosh, there's just this enormous hydraulic restriction to getting the piston up to as high as it should be. So right at the point of acceleration, when you open this throttle disc and suddenly the vacuum that's there in the intake manifold is transferred to behind the air piston, that air piston would normally shoot right up, just slam right up to, to the top of the, of the suction chamber, but it can't because this damper in the oil of the dash pot restricts the upward movement. So instead of moving up instantly, it takes half a second, second, two seconds to get all, all the way up there. During that time, the Venturi stays really, really narrow. Therefore, the vacuum at the jet 
is much greater than it would be normally and more gasoline is sucked out and into the airflow. And that's how we accomplish enriching, enriching at acceleration. One more, and that is how do we get the car started? You know, when, you're, when the engine is sitting there, it's cold, the starter motor spinning it over at, I don't know how fast it turns over, really slowly, 100 RPM, something or other. There is not enough um, air flowing through the carburetor to vaporize the gasoline in our northern cold climates that I'm used to. So the jet physically drops. Oops, sorry. The, the jet physically drops. And so this area around this tapered needle uh, gets a whole lot larger. Gasoline puddles right in there. And a lot more gasoline is available to be mixed with the air with the goal of getting something close to 14 to one. So it'll start, it's crude. Uh, the, there's a lot of unburned gasoline that passes through the carburetor in, er, and, and into the engine and comes out unburned. It just doesn't have, have time to burn. But you have to enrich in the mixture at startup. Now, what I don't have here is the HIF carburetor, which instead of dr physically dropping the jet, has yet another path for the gasoline to get from the bottom of the float ball over to this Venturi. It's got a valve in it. Open the valve, sucks lots of gasoline out, car starts up great, O-ring fails, sucks out lots of gasoline while, while you're driving. So in, anyway, that's the HIF car meter, but it's the same idea. And that is we're mixing a lot of extra gasoline before the car before the car starts. So there are four types of carburetors that we see. Um, we don't see the HDs and the MGs unless we're talking about Farina magnets. And then we see the HD carburetors. Those are, are relegated to the larger engines, um, Healy's, big Healy's, uh, Bentley's, Rolls Royce, stuff like that. So we've got the old fashioned H type, horizontal, T type, MGAs, bug eye sprites. And then we've got the HS, they considerably shorten the bodies. So those are HS carburetors, horizontal short body. In 1972, we saw the introduction of the HIF carburetor that they ran right through the end of production in England for the home models and other markets. But we saw the Stromberg come in, which is a SU clone. And then we've got this HD carburetor, which is which has got a diaphragm in it. Um, it's it's just a, a larger larger carburetor, and the mixture control is done a different way. When we look at sizing of the carburetors, it, these numbers refer to the number of eighths of an inch over one inch. That's the throat of the carburetor, which is the rear of the carburetor. So, like on a bug eye sprite you'd have H1 carburetors, which is one plus one and eighth, or one and an eighth carburetor. A midget or a T-type takes a two, H2, HS2, S1 and two eighths, or one and a quarter. MGB, MGAs, TFs take H4s, uh, four eighths, one and a half. We have no applicant, oh, excuse me, H6s, those are the MGCs one and six eighths for one and three quarters. We do not have HD eights on any, any MGs. Um, I'm not even sure it's on any BMC product. So anyway, that is my quick course. Now let me see if I, if I can get my screen, if I can get my screen back here. Um, this is gonna take me a moment because I don't know how to do this. I'm, I'm here, I just don't know. Somebody can unmute themselves and help me out here. Uh, Go to view. Oh, view. Just stop sharing. <laughs> yeah, I'm looking at my uh, new share. I'm so Go to view in the upper right hand corner. Uh, the problem is I've got I've got this thing. This uh, well, you know, if it was an MG, I'd know how to fix it. <laughs> On the bottom of the screen, you'll see participants chat, share screen, record, and reactions. If you stop sharing, it should be okay. 
if I can, if I can do that, just a moment, because we got somebody coming up. We got somebody. We got we got an an un, unusual, not an unusual guest. He is an unusual guest, but we got a guest tonight. Let me just just do what I can here to to um, see what I might. Uh, I I don't want to share. I don't want to share. I click out of this. John, upper right corner. But all I have, I all I have here is. Can you see my screen? Can you see? Yeah. Okay. Does so, anybody have a fourteen-year-old kid? Yeah, I do, but she lives in. No, she's not fourteen. You're uh, you're probably think your uh, your bar is hiding the upper right corner. You might want to bring everything down. I do that. I hit the escape. I've hit escape key. I've hit escape. I've hit escape. On you, mine, you, it's you got to get rid of the pencil tool. Yeah, I don't even know where that came from. I, I don't, I, um, I don't, I don't even know how I, I, I got there. Um, uh, oh, good, get, you're back to a pointer. Well, I've got a pointer, so try going up to view. But I don't have upper right hand corner. I don't have an upper right hand corner. That's that's my problem. I don't. Oh my god. I don't, I don't have an upper right hand corner. There you're getting there. You've got a different screen than we do. You know, probably. Hey, John, John, sometimes you got to drag your mouse all the way down to the bottom of your screen to unhide the bar down there. Well, so I've, got a, I've got a bar that says mute, stop video, security participants. Stop video. Well, no, well, that's, no, that's no, that's no, no, then it'll go away. John, what else? Stop does, John, what else does it say? Should you got view, stop video, participants, chat? What else? I don't have. I for whatever reason, chat's not there. I do have new share. I no. Do, do you have anything in the upper right hand corner that nothing, says view? Nothing in my upper right hand corner. All I have is my is my screen, and I've tried to reduce. Hit the escape button. There's the. Escape button at the top. Close that. Close it. No, just close it. Can't. John, are you doing this on what type of computer? I've got a laptop. Hit save. No, hit save. I hope it don't save. 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 Either way. Save. There you go. You're out. Bingo. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. John, you're amazing. Uh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I'm uh anyway, anyway, tonight um to, I corresponded with uh Bert Levy, the last open road. And I invited Bert to come on and Bert could talk for an hour, but I've invited him to spend 10 minutes or so and regale us with um advertisements for his book. We're all selling something. Um, I'm I'm selling my PayPal button, but Bert, do you want to unmute yourself and come on? And, and I can do that. I think. Okay. Uh, I'm unmuted. Can you hear me? We can. Yes. <clears throat> well, first, let me say one thing about SUs. <clears throat> I started my first sports car was a Triumph TR3, and I uh, raced them and everything. And one thing that you probably all know, but that John didn't say, is that SUs suck. And what I mean by that is it's the suction from the intake cycle of the engine that creates the airflow through the carburetor over the jet and through the venturi and everything. It's all the suction from the engine that makes it all work. There's nothing blowing from the front end unless you've got you know, a supercharger. And <clears throat> I've rebuilt when we had our shop, probably, I don't know, hundreds of SUs. And there's a scene in the last open road that uh, every once in a while I get a letter. I have lots of them that all say, Mr. Levy, I love your books, but, and then there'll be some arcane little piece of garbage that I somehow missed, a technical or historical detail. At one point in my book, I've got the two first C-type Jaguars in the country, which had SU sandcast carburetors going through a little town in Ohio and I say they're trundling through on the idle jets. And I get this letter from a guy that said, what does an SU carburetor not have? John? Idle jets. Idle jets, exactly. 
at any rate, many of you have probably read my books. If you haven't, please buy them. I don't care if you read them. Uh, the Last Open Roads, what, 20, 27 years old now. It's in its 10th printing. We sold over 50,000. There's, what, six sequels. Um, if you haven't read them, ask anybody that has. The Last Open Road particularly will appeal to MG guys because <clears throat> it starts with a kid in a gas station that's never seen a sports car before and a customer buys a Jag and then he starts working on an MGTC and then they start going to the races. And it's a lot of our lives. Um, we also did an audio book of The Last Open Road, came out uh, in 19 and then the pandemic hit, but took three years, we did it in the style of a 1950s radio play with different character voices, music, sound effects. Uh, it won two awards for best automotive book of 2019. Um, you can go on YouTube and just put the last open road audio book and there's excerpts and I'm done. That's it. And you're back on. That's it. What do you want me to do? <laughs> well, are you I'll offer a special deal. If anybody buys off this commercial, uh, five bucks off. How's that? Well, hey, I, you know, but you have to call me for the five bucks off because I don't think I have a mechanism to work that on the website. Just, just entertain us with with a, a single story from you've got lots. Of, you can. Oh my God! An I mean, SG, oh, I'll tell you an SG story that actually is germane. I had a customer with a. The Healy 3000 Mark II, I believe, is the one with the triple carburetors. It's got the three smaller SUs. And he loved that car, even though it handled like a boat anchor. And he brought it in for a tune-up because the idle would hunt all over the place and would pull kind of unevenly. And that stupid manifold has got these rubber um, tubes between the, diff the, the three different manifold sections. And so we went through everything. And I rebuilt the three carburetors. I thought I knew what I was doing and tuned it, timed it. When I got done, I fired it up. I didn't even have to pump the gas, which doesn't help on an SU, but that's beside the point. Hit the button, boom, settles down to a perfect 800 RPM idle. That's pretty good. Take it out, drive it around the block and the idle's hunting all over the place. So I take them all apart and do it again. And I'm checking the linkage and say, what did we do wrong? What did we do wrong? What did we do wrong? Same thing, runs perfect. Then I take it out for a drive, idles all over the place. <clears throat> I didn't know at that point that the throttle shafts can actually get loose inside an SU and create a small air leak if they're cocked just the right amount. And then that air leak disappears if they're not being disturbed. And so what was happening was because of that slight leak, uh, the mixture would change at idle after the car had gotten jounced around a little bit. So I learned that there are kits now where you can put a new throttle shaft or e there's even, I think, bushings or O-rings you can get for the throttle shafts to fix that. But that was one of those chase your tail deals where <clears throat> why can't I figure this out? John, I'm sure you've never had any of those. Why can't I figure this out? All right, now I am done. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very kindly. You can call on me later any old time, but I'm going to listen now. The um, um, my, my, my phone uh, beeped while I was in there, Jim Holiday from London, Ontario, who, who uh, races a twin cam, reminded me that twin cams also have H6 carburetors. So, yes. And they leak oil. What, the SUs or the twin cams? No, twin cams. Well, yeah. Everyone I've seen. Oh, yeah. one last thing. I'm sorry. This has nothing to do with anything I'm selling. <laughs> there, there's a big group one in our area that's like pre-war cars and T-series MGs. And they were almost cut off the schedule at the big July vintage race because last year, because of the, the pandemic and because a lot of their you know, the people that uh, they're old guys with old cars, they want to come. So they were going to cut them off the schedule. And a couple of my friends who are involved in that group called me 
and I became like, uh, let me see if I can do some good. So as of now, they're back on the schedule. And so anyone that races an MGT series, uh, you don't get a ton of track time, but there is a concours. It's a fabulous event. And I know they would love to have you. So um, just so you know, that's the July Vintage Me, what do they call it? The Brian Redmond, uh, Johnsonville Bratwurst, whatever it is. It's their big event of the summer. It's a fabulous event. It's not cheap, uh, but it's, you know, that's my home track and it's a favorite. I'm done. Okay. All right. Well, now, now we're into it. Now we're into it. So we've got, I'm, I'm going to mute everybody. It's not because I don't like you, but we're just going to get rid of the background noise. So the first one is Jason Benham. Jason, you can unmute yourself and, and come on in. Hey, John. Uh, yeah, Jason says, I know we're talking about SU carburetors tonight, and I have a question regarding how my 74 midget idles went hot or on a hot restart. Um, so what's the, what's the scoop there? Where, where are you from? I'm from uh, Feasterville, Pennsylvania. We're getting a lot of snow up here. It's bad, uh, bad driving weather. I haven't been out in it for a couple months now. Fair enough. Yeah. Um, so it's a it's a new to me 74 midget. Um, it's got the two HS2s on it, of course. And I went through, I did all the normal stuff and balanced the carbs, tuned them. Um, it runs like a dream. But when I, after I'm driving for about a half hour or so, and the car is nice and warm, and I come to a stoplight, it'll idle perfectly fine. But then after I'm sitting there for like a minute or two, it'll start like dropping down. Um, I don't know if that's something that's normal with a, those carbs. Like it, it won't die or anything like that. It'll just drop from like say a thousand down to, oh, I don't know, 700 or so. Um, and then same thing on a hot restart. It'll run perfectly fine. I shut the car off and then go back into it 20 minutes later, half hour later when it's still hot and it'll, it'll idle pretty low. Like not enough to where the red light's coming on, but it's just lower than I would like to see. Two things. Number one is that always, you, you never have your foot on the clutch. You're always idling with, the, with your foot off the clutch. The new foot. The time your foot's on the clutch is, is when you're taking off or changing gears. Mm -hmm. Start at neutral, idle at neutral, stop light, stop light, stop light, stop sign, stop start traffic, knock it into neutral, let it freewheel. There's a real problem with modern gasoline and modern gasoline begins to boil at a much lower temperature than old gasoline did. It's not uncommon to have a, to have a, a restart problem with our cars because of that. I haven't heard about it in the midget yet, but hey, you know. Um, so the only thing you can do really is, is make sure that the mixture is adjusted as well as it should be and that is when you take the piston lifting, you don't, have to, you don't have to take the air cleaners off. Just take the piston lifting pin on the side of the carburetor and lift up on it ever so slightly, as little as you possibly can, and judge the change in RPM. Now, the piston lifting pin has got some free play, so it moves up, 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 and then, and then contacts the air piston. When you lift the air piston, it, it makes the Venturi larger, therefore, it leans out the mixture. If the mixture is too rich, it'll speed the engine up when you lift that air piston, indicating that the mixture is too rich. So those are that and, and trying to find some pure gas, uh, pure-gas.org on your phone. There's a lot of places that sell gasoline without the alcohol. Therefore, the boiling point is higher. That, that can help you out. Also, just to make sure, and Bert would have found this back on that, on that uh, Healy that he was working on. If you take a can of carburetor cleaner and take the nozzle from the, from the carburetor cleaner and pss, spray it between the head and the manifold, the manifold, the heat shield, the heat shield, the spacer blocks, spacer blocks and carburetors around the carburetor shafts. If there's an air leak, the idle will change. The worse the air leak, the more it'll change. It might speed up, it might slow down. 
depends on how bad the leak is, how bad uh, what the mixture is, and what type of carburetor cleaner you're using. But if you can get a dramatic change, a couple hundred RPM, it's like, whoa, something's not right. You've got to correct that. So those are all hints. Okay. I don't have a silver bullet for you. Okay. Thanks, John. Yeah, I just wasn't wasn't sure. I figured I'd run it by you. I thought maybe you'd sure. uh, know something. Thank you. I appreciate it. Oak and oak. And from Eric Van Note, he's got a question about uh, rack boots for his TD. Um, so, uh, Eric, you want to unmute yourself? Hi, John. How are you? Hey, pretty good. Pretty good. Calling from uh, Round Rock, Texas, just outside of Austin. Oh my gosh, you guys were down to zero the other day. We were. It was bad, but it was 70 degrees this afternoon, so. And you obviously got your power back, we were, back we were on. lucky, didn't lose power or water, but. Yeah, oh my gosh. No, we, we, we were lucky. So um, the, my understanding is that the, my memory is that the rack boots for an MGB are, the, are different from a TD. And it has to do with a large, the large end. The, the, the small end is, is uh, no problem. So I, I did read out that number before. I, I wrote it down. Um, so if, if, if you had that diameter, from the end of your rack housing and you went to Napa and they happened to have this in stock, they didn't have to order it because they don't want to order it and have you measure it and then say, no, I don't want it. Right. Um, and there might be, might be some product information if you chase it. But it seems to me that T-type boots and MGB boots are, are different. Well, I was just confused because, you know, I looked at Moss and they had different part numbers. And it's like, okay, well, I can't use those. And this afternoon, I just happened to be looking at Abingdon Spares to see what they had for the TD. And their boot, it shows TD, TF, MGB, all the same part. And it's like, well, are they the same or are they not? Wow. So I, I didn't know if you might know. Um, I suspected they weren't, but I didn't want to wait Abingdon. until I had it apart to find out. Yeah, yeah. for sure. Abingdon, Abingdon's a, a relatively smaller place. Call them up and ask them. Ask yeah. them what, what, what the scoop is. You know, that, that would be helpful to know. And remember that when you're changing those, all you need to do is unscrew the tie rods from the tie rod ends. Don't take That's the tie the rod the You got to count yeah. the turns so you can get it back to back to where, where it was. So. I usually take a I usually take a silver paint pen or something and put a mark on the front of the tie rod. So as I'm exactly. counting, when I get it back, it's like it's exactly in the same place. So. Excellent, Ex exactly so. Okay, okay. Well, hey, thanks, Thank thanks much. So Mark Goldfarb, John, I'm getting ready to replace the carpet my 74B. What are your thoughts on the molded kits as opposed to the flat kits? So Mark, you can, whoa, you can unmute yourself. You're there. Okay. What, uh, my experience, you know what I'm going to do? I've got some background. I don't know if that's you or somebody else. It's quiet right now. Um, um, my experience with carpet kits is that for every hundred bucks you save, you add a day in fitting. We used to, I, you know, the, the molded carpet sets are absolutely the best. They go in easily. Uh, I don't know how much they are, but um, it's, it is worth it. You cannot take a flat piece of notebook paper and wrap it around a sphere. It doesn't work. You can't take a flat piece of carpet and wrap it around a wheel arch. It doesn't work. You end up with folds. I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's like, do the folds bother you? You know, but even even when you go to to put it on, um, the tunnel is is the is the bugger. You know, and boy, the original ones were steam formed. Oh my gosh, they fit like a glove. They're great, they're expensive. They're great. So my suggestion is to get get the nicest one you can because the installation time is less and it looks better when you're done. No. The only thing that's actually molded is for the tunnel. Is that right? The rest of the carpet or and the wheel arches in the back, I guess. That's it. Okay. 
does anybody that you know of besides Moss sell molded kits or is it strictly a Moss? You know, if you can, you can go online and you can go to England. Um, sometimes, you know, so you gotta be careful because their carpet kits, for instance, have got all the, all the, uh, the heel mats and that kind of stuff on the right hand side of the carpet, not suitable uh, for a left hand drive car, but you can always ask. And they sell a lot of stuff off to the continent. So there's a lot, there's two or three places in England that sell carpeting, including Moss. Just because Moss has got one kit here doesn't mean that the kit from Moss out of England is the same kit, interestingly enough. But there's the MG Owners Club, there's Brown and Gammons, uh, there, and there are other places too. So even though it would seem like, oh my gosh, it's going to cost a fortune to get it shipped. You know, it's it just match it, you know, match it. If, if it costs a hundred bucks to have it shipped compared to, you know, compared to what? Compared to here. So, but I don't know any other place here. Yes. Uh, Rimmer Brothers too. Rimmer, R-I-M-E-R. They yeah. It used to be just a triumph place, but yeah, are they here? They've got a they got an outlet here in the states now too, right? I mean that. Yeah, but they've been closed since COVID, and um, if you call, it bounces to England. Okay. And those guys are very, very knowledgeable. Very okay. knowledgeable. Okay. There's also um, NTG, NTG November Tango Golf. Services, NTG services in Ipswich, although they're more earlier stuff. Um, um, although everyone's tending towards newer stuff in England, they, they they're they're selling parts for brand new cars. You know the, the the brand new Chinese cars. But anyway, so there's a lot of other places. Just just go on the web and, and see what you can find. Sometimes you can go on MG Enthusiast. Um, MG Experience, excuse me, mgexperience.net, uh, and and get some really good answers. Sometimes you got to wade through, wade through some stuff first. But anyway, so those are all those are all ideas. So John, this is Dave Brown. Yes. Uh, Prestige Auto Trim in the UK also has some pretty good carpets, and they're having their winter sale right now. Okay. So just Google that. I, I Prestige. Prestige. In fact, I bought my soft top and my tonneau covers from them. Their quality seems excellent. They don't have a molded kit though. And I was actually thinking that I may end up buying the carpet there, but after this conversation, they don't have molded and, and, well, and that's the thing. Um, yeah, I put one of their kits in and I didn't have any trouble with the wheel arches. There was a little fitting around the, the um, prop shaft cover. Well, here's, here's my other thought on the, on the tunnel, I understand it might not be quite as flat, but on a, on a car like my 74, you're covering it with a console. I mean, does that cover some of the ills or are you still gonna have problems? It, it'll still be bulky. It will be bulky. Okay, but you, but you use the prestige and that seemed to go on okay? Well, my wife has very high standards, <laughs> so. Okay. She married me and then I restored her car. So what does that tell you? <laughs> Actually, it might've been the other way around. I think I think I restored her car and then she married me. There you go, well, so, in case you needed further there work. There you go. Uh, yeah. Well, I appreciate the advice. I'm gonna look in the UK for, for some molded kits. I mean, the, the advice I had originally gotten after talking to a lot of people was the molded is the way to go for the reasons that you stated. Um, and then I talked to some other people and said, oh, the flat kits aren't too bad, but Coming back to your experience, it's probably worth it to find the molded carpet kit that'll work for me, I, I'm thinking. Hey, hey, John. Yes. We're all, we're all the same age here. The least time you could spend in that car <laughs> trying to mold fitting carpet, get the mold it and get in and get out. That's great right, advice. And don't, and don't do not glue the carpet to the floor. Don't. I, I, I got a sound deadening, heat deadening, it's, it's called X-Mat. It's like a Dynamat. Yeah, yeah. That does glue to the car. And my understanding is, yeah, you don't glue the carpet to that. You just leave it loose. Yep. Don, Don, what I did was I bought it from Moss. I bought the molded kit. And then I bought some extra roll. 
And uh, then I went to an upholstery shop and the uh, car upholstery shop and they put it all in for me <laughs> and it was perfect. Uh, and the Moss one doesn't always have uh, an edging uh, mm -hmm. sewn onto it. And uh, so the upholstery shop did it for me. So, and they put it all in, put the snaps all in that I needed and so forth. So uh, if you can find a good car upholstery shop, the way to go too. Great. Perfect. You got so yeah. many, you asked a simple question and now, you're, now you're, your solution is even, even more complex. So I've been banging my head against the wall for a week on this. So it's just right back where I was, but I think okay. the moment is the way I originally wanted to go. And I think after this conversation, I need to look at that further before going out and buying the flat carpet. Okay. Good sense. Okay. Uh, I, I've, I've installed a couple of the uh, flat kits and uh, strong language will be called for. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> okay, right. Thank you very right. much. Appreciate I'm going it. to uh, mute everyone here, not because I don't like you, but just to get everybody back to zero here. Now we're off to uh, Walker Eaton. And, he, and Walker, you can unmute yourself. Walker's wondering if where he can find some brackets, some windscreen brackets for a TF. So they're out there. They're certainly out there. It's just finding them. So Walker, you can unmute yourself uh, if you can. Or if you can't, um, somebody else can post up in the chat section. If you've got some, Walker, you can look through those. Um, or you can drop me a note and I'll try to get back in touch with Walker. But th they're out there. You just, you've got, it's so frustrating sometimes to find one of those, um, one of those really precious pieces. MGB stuff you can get from Paul Deershaw. I use his name every week a couple of times. Paul Deershaw, it's Sports Car Craftsman in Arvada, Colorado. He's great, uh, but that's MGB stuff. But T-type stuff, it, you, you've got to start calling around to the different T-type suppliers, um, I, individual people, and there's no substitute for advertising for it. You know, putting a classified ad out someplace. I'm looking for this. That that sometimes works in reverse. <clears throat> it works on um, all those dating sites. You know, the, the reverse search. So if John, I, yes, uh, a guy named Hugh, and I don't know how to pronounce his last name. P I T E, Pete or Petit, okay. whatever. Uh, frequents both the uh, enthusiast and the um, uh, experienced sites. And he's got a wealth of uh, used parts. I've got some TD brackets, but they won't work on the TF. Uh, and there's another guy in Kentucky. I can't think of what it is. But if you go on both of those sites and put in a request, you've got a good shot at getting it because some of those windshield chrome parts are unavailable from the commercial vendors. They, they just don't, they're just not there. But the used, used parts guys, collect that stuff and they can be invaluable. Thank I've you. got a lot of stuff from Hugh Pete. Okie doke. Right. John? Yes. Didn't you years ago were looking for a part for your MGA and you sent out letters or something? And yeah, but before the internet, I did. I yes. was looking, looking I got a six I've got a 62, I got a Mark II uh, MGA and and it's got a, a little a little tiny clip right in the center of the windscreen with an MG embossed on it and I couldn't find one for love nor money so I sent out like 30 letters and and Norman Knott from British Sports Car or British Car Services in Stockton California answered me he had the part I don't know what I paid him for it 10 bucks 50 but I don't remember um, and it started a, a, a a friendship and he and I corresponded and met each other a couple of times he's passed away sometimes the sun comes on he, he's uh, on here David yeah so anyway yes the, so that is the reverse that's the reverse search instead of looking for in one ads so you 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 put you, know, you put out a one ad I want this so, okie doke we're gonna mute everybody right now and and we're gonna go on to Tom Tom to everyone so Tom's got a 73B. So Tom, you know who you are because it's about spark plugs. And we can 
you can unmute yourself. Number, the plugs three and four seem to be running lean. I've tried to adjust the carb, but turning the enriching screw in or out doesn't seem to help. So a 73 MGB has got HIF carburetors. Those are susceptible to more trouble than the HS or the H type, so that they don't leak. Um, the, um, well, I, they all leak, but uh, the HIFs, the, the usual complaint is they're running too rich. It's hardly ever that they're running too lean. So the reason that your, your number three and number four are running too lean include, there's a problem with the emissions. There's a problem with the tube that comes off the, off the float bowl and goes over the charcoal canister. Some, something's up. Remove that tube. Remove the tube from the float bowl on your rear HIF. Does that make a difference or not? It should not make one iota of difference. This isn't the tube that comes from the front tap and inspection cover. This is the tube that goes over to the charcoal canister. Next thing is the uh, float height. Can't check that without taking the carburetors off the car. Oh, fun. Another thing is to take the suction chamber off, take the, the, take the spring out, take the air piston out, take a look at it and make sure that the needle isn't down too far, that the shoulder of the needle is sitting where it's supposed to be. And also while you're there, you can crank the adjuster screw and watch the jet move up and down doesn't move up and down much at the most. I think that probably moves a quarter of an inch. So somewhere in there is your problem, somewhere in there. Unless it's a vacuum leak and you find that with the spray carburetor cleaner. So right. I, think, I think I've got all those. There's a really bizarre one on the intake manifold, MGAs through MGBs. And there's a one and one eighth freeze plug driven into the end from casting like a Welch plug, freeze plug. Sometimes if you get way too much intake manifold pressure, why would you get pressure in your intake manifold by the car running um, lean right at the end and backfiring through the carburetors? It'll blow one of those plugs out. I've never seen one sort of open just a little bit and leaking some air. But again, you find all that stuff with the spray carburetor cleaner. So I hope that helps. Well, the, um, a couple questions on that. Yeah. Uh, um, so I've, I mean, I've watched your video a lot. <laughs> and my concern on the rear two was that being, I didn't want it to run extremely lean and burn up a piston or something. Right. Right. And my front two, I'll go through and adjust it, you know, lift up the, um, the air uh, piston and mm -hmm. that seems to rise and I've got it so where it'll rise and drop off. I still think those front ones, my, in fact, I've uh, lost number two spark plug a few times because it falled out. I think the, those front two are running pretty rich. And you had mentioned about um, taking the dash pots off uh, taking a tube or blow down into, and that's where I lost it at. What am I going to blow into? And I think you have to hold your finger over the main jet and watch fuel come out. So if the, if you think the HIF is running too rich, that's the usual complaint on HIFs. Mm -hmm. It's most often because the rotary choke, which connects the, the, the fuel float bowl to the Venturi to run right underneath the air piston that valve fails and it leaks a little bit of gasoline and under those extreme under the extreme vacuum that's there it sucks gasoline out of the flow bowl and enriches the mixture so to find out if that's what's going on take the suction chamber off the spring the air piston they take a, a piece of tubing um 3 16 tubing whatever yeah. and put it on the on the uh, 3 16 outlet for the vent for the float bowl. Okay. And just puff into it with your mouth. Just puff into it. And you'll get a stream of gasoline that'll shoot two feet high up out of the main jet. It's like, whoa. <laughs> you know, you just puff into it a little bit. It's just, it's, it's incredible how much fuel 
comes up out, out of there. So now that you know, okay, you got fuel in there, you know that you've got it hooked up right. You put your index finger on the main jet okay. and then blow so hard you see stars. Don't hook up an airline to it, you'll blow the carburetor apart. But just blow really, really, really hard and look at the hole to the rear of the main jet. Actually, there's two holes to the rear of the main jet. The one in line with the main jet is an emulsion tube, and we're not talking about that one. It's offset a little bit. And that's where the gasoline burbles out of to enrich the mixture. So what we're looking at is that other hole back there. And they're, they're, not, they're not mystery holes. They're an uh, eighth of an inch in diameter or so. Okay. And if you see any, any gasoline coming out of there when you're blowing that hard, it's too much. There's zero, zero gasoline should come out of there. If there is, then there's something up. It could be adjustment. It could be the fingers, you know, the fingers on the interconnecting links. It could be a hundred things. Most often, or always, I should say, <laughs> always, it's the number 13 O-ring which should be installed in there in Viton, a Viton O-ring. I bought some. Okay. Is, is that, um, that O-ring obvious where I'm looking for? I mean, am I going to find that or I got to take more the rotary, It's underneath the rotary choke assembly. OK. That they right. face each other on, on the carburetor. They get kind of dicey taking them apart. It's, uh, um, you can get that. There's a rotary spring in there. You get that trapped when you put it back together. Just be cautious. Don't okay. take don't take them both apart at the same time. When the well, last question, when when I put the dash pods back in, mm -hmm. uh, where do I stop full? You know, putting the oil. I mean, how how much is enough? Fill them up. Fill them up. Whatever's excess, just pisses out the top and lubricates yeah. the linkage or undercoats the car. Yeah, I like that part. All right, thanks. Okay. All right, and then if, if you have more trouble, call me. Uh, Dave Brown's available. He, he was on tonight, and uh, he, he can answer your question if you're part of the B register and stuff, too. So, Okay, our next one up, I'm going to mute everybody here. Uh, Malcolm Davies, I'm new, uh, invite by a friend. Uh, he's not an MG owner, but uh, he's familiar with SU carbs from, from uh, Triumphs. So anyway, he's just letting us know that he's interested, he's watching. Malcolm, it's a pleasure to have you here. And the next one up is Bert Levy, who says MGs suck. Actually, there is no such thing as vacuum, right? There's no such thing as dark, there's only light. There's no such thing as cold, there's only heat. And there's no such thing as vacuum, there's only pressure. But it's just so And much. there's no such thing as bad weather, only inappropriate clothing. <laughs> okay. Thanks, Bert. <laughs> um, anyway. Oh, the guy that had the one that's running rich on the front, too, yeah. and lean on the back, too. Just two things real quick. Are you sure that you've got the two carburetors equalized, you know, with a piece of rubber hose and, and that the float levels are the same on both of them? Uh, I have not, sound? and I was watching John's video just before tonight, and I thought, you know, I don't have, I don't know that I could hear the difference, so I'm going to get You can, tool. honest to God. Well, if that is, <laughs> yeah. if your hearing's still okay. What? <laughs> Let me tell you, when, when I'm out doing my, my rolling tech, one car, looking at one car after another, that's my tool of choice. My yeah. half, two foot piece of half inch heater hose, and the owner will be standing there. So I hear, listen. They go, I can't hear anything different, you know. So, and it's so it takes an ear, but yeah, it's a pretty handy to try it. It's cheap to two foot of heater hose. If you if you don't use it on your car, you can use it to beat your kids or your dog. Or <laughs> then you know, the, and the, the the good thing about the car is that it does run very well. I mean, it seems to idle good. I just trying to get those to burn similar. That's the proof. In the, 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 proof yeah, really. <laughs> the proof is in the pudding. And the proof is what the spark plugs look like. 
right. after, after a 10 mile run. And the insulator, which looks white, is white when you buy them and install them, should be a light tan color. But if one and two are dramatically different than three and four, then you know that there's a difference in the mixture. So you can get confused too, because you can have oil that gets on the spark plug. But chances are that you know, one and two look the same and three and four look the same. It isn't it's because, a carburation. Yeah. yeah. It, it isn't. You can also have a slight air leak uh, aft of the throttle plate on the rear on the rear carburetor. Okay. That would do the same thing. Yeah. That's, that's what that carburetor cleaner that's, is for. And, and I'm, the weather's going to break, so I'm going to brave it and go out and work on the thing, so. Yes, yes. <laughs> All right, okay. thanks. I'm going to mute everybody again, and because my, I have to make my unabashed pitch, please go on my website. There's good stuff on the website. Uh, it's not all up to date yet, but it will be someday. There are forms on there. There are um, resources as far as getting stuff rebuilt, uh, your original alternator, your original starter motor, or something or other. There's information like that there, and there's also my PayPal button. So please go on and at least consider you know, if, if something's helped you out here. Our next one here is from Ryan Masfeller, who is only logging in to say that um, my, my videos are very helpful to him because he's a new owner of a 1980 MGB, a car that's 41 years old, and we still refer to, we, I still refer to him as a new B. Anything with a rubber bumper is a new bee. So anyway, uh, Ryan, thanks for, for being here. From Harry's iPhone, I've got a 74B with HS4 carburetors. Yes, nice. How do I tell if the throttle shafts um, are rebushed? Um, it's hard. It's hard without looking right down on it. But the original housings are aluminum, they had bushings cast into them. If they've been rebushed, you can see an, an annulus, a, a circle of, of brass or bronze or oil-like bushing around the shaft, but you'd have to look at it pretty carefully. The bottom line is, does it leak? That's the bottom line. And they all leak, it's a shaft. You can't help but leak. If you take it, it no matter, who rebuilt your carburetors. If you take a can of spray carburetor cleaner and, and spray and spray and spray right at that shaft, some of that carb cleaner is gonna get sucked through there. It sure is, if the car's in good tune, get a real high manifold intake um, vacuum. Um, it just is, but can you get a hold of the shaft and wiggle it? There shouldn't, you shouldn't have any uh, radial um, movement, radial. Okay. So, All right, thanks. Okie doke. All right, so from Norman Cove, Bert, the variable jet SU carburetor is the best ever. So we're, we're in alignment on that. From Felix, I've got a 62 MGA Mark II with the original differential and wire wheels. The left side differential hubs hub threads stripped. That's because the diff, the hub threads, those are the threads on the diff housing. That's because somebody put something on there and, and turned it to unscrew it, but that's tightening them. Oh man. Um, by removing the lock tab, I gained access to enough threads to apply 225 foot pounds and with red Loctite, in my opinion, is this good? Is this satisfactory? This is why, you know, I, I have to buy insurance to have, this, <laughs> to have this Zoom session in case I tell somebody, oh yeah, sure, oh, that, that'll be just fine. And then you go and drive it and your wheel comes off the car. And if the wheel comes off, then the brake, the other brakes don't work because the shoes back there expand. We had a, we had a guy with an early MGB one time, his rear axle, brake drum, everything, hub, all came off the rear axle. 
boy, that's dicey. But 225 pounds in red, I, it just seems like, it seems to me like that would be good enough. I don't know how to restore those threads. Um, I do have a die for the right-hand side, but I, I, never, I never got a die for the left-hand side because John, uh, who, who used a hammer on, on the right side um, and hit it a little too hard and mushroomed some threads, uh, there is a thread file. So he cleaned it up with that first, and then I got the I got the die and, and sent it to him. I don't know. It's real creepy. You don't want that rear wheel to come off. But 225 pounds. That is, I mean, that's so, so much, so much force back there. But all it has to do is come off, and then the whole wheel comes out of the car. I I don't know what to tell you. You know, depends where you are. If you can find another another housing, what a hassle. What a hassle. So are, are you still here, Felix? Either 62 MGA? Yes, I am. Okay, all right. So, boy, I just, um, I don't, I don't know. I just don't know how, I don't know if any other way to, yes, I do, yes, I do. Um, so you take, you take the hub off, you take a, a punch, you hit the you hit the housing from the inside with a hammer, tunk tunk tunk, so that you're you're hitting it towards the outside and therefore expanding expanding the outside diameter. Okay, and so that's that tedious. Oh my gosh, yes. But um, that would be one way to do it. I don't know any other way to fix those threads. I just don't even know what to tell you. It sounds creepy. You're gonna decide yourself whether it's it seems like it's rational enough um yeah that 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 lock tab is only what i mean thirty thousand thick i mean that's not very thick now well, maybe more than that 50 but not much i can't believe you picked up i i don't i don't know i don't know what to say okay well where, where are you calling from i'm calling from puerto rico Oh yeah, okay, all right. Thank you kindly for your do donation. So you are very welcome. And thank you for all the time that you put into this. It's going to be hard to find another axle housing in Puerto Rico. I mean, help me out. My that's that's my gut, you know. So I found one, but it's for a uh, steel wheel, and I have wire wheels. Yeah, and they, they are different. They are absolutely different. The steel wheel one is wider. So that's right. So. Okay. Um, Maybe I will be able next week to get one, but uh, the guy doesn't know if he has one. He'll let me know next okay. week. And uh, next next time we meet, then I'll let you know. Okay, that great. Went. Okay, no. great. Well, thank you anyway. Hey, thank you. Thanks for checking in. No problem, every time. Okay, so I'm gonna mute everybody again. Here we go. John Avalone asks, how much oil does the dash pot hold? Jeez, I don't know tablespoon, but I never measure it. I just fill it up. And what again, whatever's extra, um, just oozes out the top. Strombergs, Strombergs are set up differently and they lose their oil during operation because of the vacuum. Once the O-ring, the number 10 O-ring goes bad, the number eight O-ring go, goes bad. And those, though it, it's um, with a Stromberg, I tell people every time you get gasoline, put oil in the carburetor. And the easiest way to do that, if you don't mind foraging in the trash at the gas station, you look in there, there's always a quart of oil, what's left of a quart of oil. And everyone's in too much of a hurry to get the last tablespoon of oil out of there. So just grab it and, and turn that upside down and drain that into your Stromberg. Now that'll, that'll hold you. You can always carry oil with you too. Okay, let's see. Um, I'm going through the uh, going through, and Ryan as Ryan Massfeller says, how often should you add oil to your SU carburetors? It's like once, once it can't go anywhere. It well, I say it can't go anywhere. There's all kinds of weird stuff. That I've seen holes where it gets sucked out um, through normal operation, but. That's so bizarre. 
normally you put the oil in there and that, that's good enough. Now, if you fill it all the way up and then you go to look at it the next time, there's hardly, you know, you look down in there, there's hardly any oil. But as long as when you take the damper and just before the threads catch, you push down, you feel the restriction of the oil, just before you just start to screw it in, that's plenty of oil in there. So this is like an MGA owner, an MG, early MGB owner who fills up his radiator every time he turns his car off and it gets cold because they can barely see the, the water in the expansion tank. So he fills it up and then the next time it gets hot, it all pisses out because it expands and then it contracts and sits down there. So anyway, just once is plenty. Harry, let's see. Uh, Plume cut back a lot when turned on his computer presentation. Uh, uh, so I can't, um, are, everybody can hear me okay though? It, it's working now. Okay, okay, great. Great, Harry, thank you. Thank you very much. All right, from Harold Nesbitt, do all SU carburetors have a spring on the air piston? No. You're looking for force. You're looking for a downward force. Harold, where, where are you from? Are you, can you unmute yourself? Hi, I'm from uh, Boise, Idaho. Oh my gosh, oh my gosh. So the earliest carburetors use these heavy, beautiful, they polish up so nicely, heavy brass pistons. Okay. But, but you get a downward force by using gravity that's the brass piston, or you get the downward force from using a spring. Spring's cheap. There were also um, steel pistons for a while too. Uh, I think maybe steel and aluminum combined. Um, and again, they use gravity to get that downward force. So any, anything, uh, anything after 1956 ha has a spring on it. And I have seen T-types of the brass pistons dutifully with springs on them, which then push them down too much, restrict the venturi, and make it run too rich. So almost everything you do to an SU makes it run too rich. Very few things you can do to make it make it run too too lean. So what's your weather up there right now, Harold? Uh, the weather's pretty nice. We had uh, quite a snowstorm last week, probably about a, a foot of snow in, in one or two days, but that's all melted away now, so it's getting pretty nice. Nice. What, yeah. what, year, what year and model do you own? I have a 51 TD, and it has those brass pistons. Uh, the first time I took it apart, I, I, you know, I took it apart, cleaned it up, put it back together, and I started looking at diagrams of SU carburetors, and every diagram I looked at has a spring. Yeah. So then I ordered a couple of springs, and then I started reading more material again, and, and I read there's some SUs that don't have the spring. So that's why I asked the question. So you got two springs for sale? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, or am I might use them for something else. Yeah, okay. All right, well, hey, thanks, thanks for logging in. Yeah, thank you. I have those uh, brass pistons in mine. Yeah, thank those you. are those are real. Those look really pretty. Let's see. Okay, Bert. Bert's weight weighed in again about the about the SU sucking, and um, Scott Lynn's weighed in on looking at parts manuals, uh, and gives a, a hint there on, on which ones are which, but it's the heavy pistons. If the pistons are featherweight, because you can use you can use modern pistons um, in an old carburetor as long as the guide groove is in the right place. Uh, from Judd to everybody, just put the motor back in my 53 TD when we went to hook up the fuel line between the pump and the rear carb the line was about an inch too short. This is the same line that was on the car for years before we pulled the motor. Any idea what we did to make the fuel line no longer long enough? No, <laughs> no. I mean, yes, yes, because 
um, the, the footballs, uh, the original footballs have their banjo fittings outboard and you can get those reversed. So the banjo fittings are inboard and therefore the banjo fitting sits an inch, inch and a half more towards the center of the carburetors than towards the outside of the carburetors. It's the only thing I can think of. Okay, so so just uh, undoing the center screw on the float bowl. Well, first take the well the 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 line from rear to front was never disconnected. So I don't see how they could have turned much. You know, oh, I'm, I'm on mute. No, I'm not on mute. No, no, you're, you're not. No, I was holding my hands up like- I How about know. the motor mounts? There, there are, there are, are uh, there are mysteries. Uh, on a T-type, you don't get much fore and aft um, or left and right. Uh, but on, a, on an SU, on your rear, on your rear carburetor, the, <laughs> the banjo, oh wait, I, I gotta get rid of my, just a second, stop my video, let me get, yes. get my background, just a minute here, go up here, get none, there we go. Um, your, your, um, here's, here's the, the, top of the suction chamber, here's the float bowl, this is the rear one, and here's the, here's the banjo fitting on, on the rear. And, and, and you, all you gotta do is switch the float bowls and that's over here, and that moves it an inch or so. So I don't know, it's me. I can try it. When you figure it out, you tell us next time. So, there's all kinds of mysteries. So, <laughs> So I had a, uh, uh, another fuel line. I don't know why I had it. it uh, uh, and it is a, both of these are the braided stainless steel bling pretty fuel lines. Uh, the, the one that was a little bit longer is at least the outside diameter is much smaller. The inside diameter looked eh, fairly close. I really couldn't say that it was smaller or the same. Assuming it's smaller, do you think that would have a uh, restrictive effect no. on the amount of no. fuel? No. no, no. Okay. Well, then it ain't broke. I'll fix. I'll leave it. <laughs> okay. All right. Okay. From Paul. From Paul to everybody. So Paul is seeking opinions on an aluminum flywheel on a mildly tuned seventy-seven B. The carburetor. The the engine's fitted with HIFs. Mild street cam, little higher compression. I'm looking for more spirited acceleration, but, but he doesn't have a mic. He doesn't have a microphone, so he's just gonna listen. So I would say to Paul, absolutely not. You need the, you need the momentum in your flywheel to get you from, from stop to start at the stop sign. That's why the flywheel has the weight that it does. So that when you let your foot off the clutch, the engine doesn't stall. Race cars have got aluminum flywheels, absolutely. But that's because they idle at 4,000 RPM and you're interested in changing RPMs very quickly. A street car, it, it's, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't play well on a street car. You'll, you'll end up burning up your clutch. Um, I, I'm, no, I'm no fan, and you can tell, I'm no fan of, of them at all. Now, that said, you might be able to take a pound or two off in a, a flywheel, but not much more than that. John? Yes. Uh, I got to drive Kent Prather's uh, National Champ oh. MGA and some other cars with MG engines he's built. And he believed in having a steel flywheel, he'd lighten it. But he said, particularly on the three main engines, you needed the damper on the front and the weight of the flywheel on the back to keep the whip and flex out of the crankshaft. And, uh, and there's a lot of truth that the five mains, I don't know if it would bother it, but, and also to go to all the work 
of putting an aluminum flywheel in, if you can tell the difference in the seat of your pants, you're a better man than I am. Why don't you just tell everybody you put it in? You get the same effect. Yeah, the the uh, the butt the butt dyno is good for changes of five horsepower or more. Yeah, and you'll you just can't. It, there, there's no there's no advantage here. So anyway, I we just say you make a donation. I've just saved you. What what's a flywheel? It's got to be a couple hundred bucks. Um, so anyway, and the and the labor. Now, Pete Masson weighs in right, right after that and says, I have one and love it. So <laughs> some guys like redheads, some guys like blondes. So I, I, you, can't, you can't say for sure, yeah. but um, Pete, Pete's got one. All right, so next, next one up here, Mary Ruth, um, where does the dash pot oil go and why do we have to refill it so often? Again, you're just filling it because you don't know that it's as full as it needs to be, unless you've got a Stromberg. You get a Stromberg, it's getting sucked away and you got to change that number eight O-ring. But if it's an SU, there's still plenty of oil in there that I'm, I'll go with that. Larry, Larry Maselli, uh, can you give a recommendation for a mild street cam for a 67 MGB GT. The standard cam is 252 de degrees of duration. Opens at 16, closes at 56. It's open for 180. That's 252 degrees that it's open. Half of that. Um, um, any, anyway, it's, um, you can push it to 270. You can push it to 270, but by around 270, it gets to be too much for street use. You can go for higher lift. You can go for higher lift. It's a lot cheaper to buy it in the cam than it is to get roller rockers or or uh, offset offset rockers. You don't need any of this stuff for street cars. You just don't. You don't need it. If you if you port the cylinder head, just port the head especially the exhaust port so that you can get the hot exhaust gases out of there. You can, you can, sh you can put, go up to 10 and a half to one compression, no problem. And nominally you get five horsepower per point of compression. So you can get a lot more horsepower out of that engine. Um, but I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't go beyond 270. The cams I like are from David Anton at APT fast. In Riverside, California, Dave Anton and Dave Vizard wrote to, um, were the Davids that wrote the tuning the A series engine. Uh, that uh, Anton is really, really, really good with this stuff. I have a listing of camshafts, and there must be two pages, two eight and a half by eleven pages, in portrait, not not in land uh, or in the landscape, not in portrait. But there have to, so there have to be what 60, 70 cams on there, and they all have these exotic names: street, fast road, three quarter race. It's like th those are the same guys that make up paint color names. <laughs> it's the it's the it's just the numbers that you're after. It's just the numbers. And Larry, if I'm happy, I'm happy to send anybody a, that list that I have of MGB cams. I fortunately was going through everything here and caught one, who was that? I, I forgot, thanks for your email back. Uh, the last time we were talking about the XPAG, XPAG engines, and I said I'd send out information to whoever wrote, had a couple of people write. I've got a ton of information, um, but I didn't remember to send that information out until just today. But Larry, Contact me and I'd be I'd be happy to to do that. I'd buy yeah, thanks. I'd buy a good cam. I'm not sure I'd buy one from. I don't know. You buy them from. They come in a tube. They're reground. You don't know where they're from. Is the number uh, one, is the number one lobe the same as the number three lobe? John, this is this is a '67 that's been rebuilt. Okay. And and the cam has failed. And it's from the prior owner putting in a re-ground re cam shaft 
that obviously wasn't hardened properly. So I just want to get a good quality cam. It's a 67B. It's never going to be a race car. I just want something. Uh, and I don't mind going with a stock cam if that's your recommendation. I just thought a little bit is fine, but I'm not interested in it sitting and blurping at, at stoplights. I just wanted to get a recommendation for something that maintains its reliability as much as you can get out of a 67B without an, going stupid. Yeah, send me an email. I'll, I'll send you the list. Thanks, John. Jo John. Yes. Peter Robinson here. Um, in, in, interesting comments you say there. I rebuilt my 79B in 92, and I didn't do a whole lot to it, but I, I put a Kent cam in, and it was, interesting your comments, a fast road. And it's obviously something a little bit faster than a fast road, but I didn't check all the angles on it. It goes great at anything above 3,000, 3,000 to 6,000 on the freeway, it's great. But it's no good for idling and traffic and the rest of it. I would not recommend anything like that. Keep that's it right. fairly standard, it's, that, that's fine. It sounds, it sounds like a race car, but it's horrible to drive on the street. That's all. <laughs> you know, this is Dave Brown. I agree with that. And if you want to go with a base cam, which is a good choice, just advance it a degree and you'll get kind of the best of both worlds. Yeah. 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 I thought uh, back then I thought, yeah, I'll put a, I put a, I, I used to race a, um, a Lotus Cortina and it, had, it was cami. And, but if you're going to race a car, put a race cam in, but if you're going to drive it on the street no. I, so I regret that, but I've still got that cam in after all these years. <laughs> well, the, the camshaft is the main controller. It decides whether the engine turns clockwise or anti-clockwise. It, it, it determines whether it runs best at 80, 800 or 8,000 RPM. And it's always a range. You can't have a cam that is great at 2,000 RPM and great at 8,000 RPM. You, you just, you can't, that's, that's why there's, that's why you got that variable valve timing and stuff like that on modern engines to make them more efficient at the different speeds and di different loads that they have. I, I think I think in, in conclusion to, to what I was trying to say, I ordered a, what I thought was a, a mild cam and the cam that I actually got in there is probably a race cam and a race cam is okay for the track, but that, that's all. So just... Yeah, I... I rebuilt, um, I rebuilt the, the engine on my 1962 MGA and Forrest Johnson, who took over my shop, took a, I think it's a VP12, uh, one of Anton's cams out of his engine. He said, I hate it. And I says, it go fast. And he goes, yeah. I said, oh, I'll take it. Well, I, I finally got it so it's working okay around idle. But oh my gosh, at 40 miles an hour, you put your foot down, it just takes off. You know, but what kind of driving are you going to do? If you're driving around town, that's one kind of cam. If you're driving on the expressway, it's another kind. Driving on the racetrack, it's another kind. So that's, you've got to decide what, what kind of driving you're doing first. Anyone who wants that list, send me General a rule of thumb everything you do to to make a street car more like a race car makes it worse as a street car. Yes. And it costs you money. Yes. Yep. All, all of that okay. is absolutely true. Thanks, guys. Okay. I'm going to mute everybody again. Not because I don't like you. Just to get rid of the background noise. Harry, John, did you ever get a chance to look into dustless blasting? Dustless blasting. No, I haven't. I, we, All right. we did talk about that. So okay. go ahead. No, I just wanted, wanted your opinion of what you thought about it or if you saw it. It's just the videos on, online that show you how it works. I was just thinking about using it on my fenders. Um, the dustless part is really nice. John, it's Jim. Yes. <clears throat> Yes, Jim. Um, we have a club member who used uh, dustless blasting. <clears throat> There's 
came to his house, pulled it in the driveway, and did it in a couple hours. He loved it. The nice thing about it is, um, opposed to sandblasting, which I've done several times, had done, is you can paint the inside of the car without having sand all over it. Most painters don't like doing that. If there's anyone out there as a painter, I know the guys that paint my cars here just refuse. They, they, I'm, I'm still picking sand out of a car that I had done 25 years ago. I swear nothing work, works better than, than sand. Sand is great, but it's like having a picnic on the beach. It's just sand gets everywhere. It's just, you can't get rid of it. You can take a body that's on a, on a, a rotisserie and you can take all the air pressure in the world and all the vacuums in the world and all the soft hammers in the world and turn that thing over and over and over. Tunk, 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 tunk. You get it all done. You get, you're all set to go. There's, there's sand in it. It's just, you can't get rid of it. And the sand holds moisture. So it, it's, uh, yeah. And I think the cost on that uh, dust of sandblasting was around seven, eight hundred dollars. Okay, Jim, thank you very much. Yeah, hey Jim, I got a uh, guy coming in in about four weeks to do uh, my blasting on my uh, 70, 71, and he's getting ready to charge me about seven hundred. But one of the things I had to do to keep the bill down was I had to get the underbody cleared of all that rubber coating. Oh. Otherwise oh. he said it was gonna be a lot more because the rubber kind of runs along like a ball. <laughs> oh my gosh, yep. So I'll let you know if it warps anything but I'm going with the, the dustless blasting. We'll, we'll all be on here a couple of weeks next month a couple months after we may even keep this up despite covid i mean despite the lack of covid if that, if that ever happens so jim um or um yeah harry you can come come back to us and, and uh, talk to us about what you did and your experience all right thanks okay all right jim wright what is your opinion on moss sourced new su carburetor sets for an mga 1500 um, I've got two thoughts on that. They're, they're made by SU or, or the company that, that is the follower of SU and they've got all the, all the parts and everything, but they're not MGA carburetors. They don't look like MGA carburetors exactly. And they're about three times as expensive as getting your MGA carburetors rebuilt, no matter how buggered up they are. Send them to somebody. Dave Brown's on online right now. B R A U N. Um, at, at Joe Curto is the is the king of, of SU carburetors. There's a, somebody took over for Jim Taylor out in Iowa someplace. There's a lot of places you can get your original SU carburetors rebuilt. And and I I mean I just want to tell you that I think that that the carburetors will look better and they'll they'll be better. Than, um, than the new carburetors that you buy. That's, that's my, uh, let, let me find my picture here, there. There, how's, how's that set, you know? Yeah. That, that yeah, I've got a 59, uh, 1500 and up in Peterborough, Ontario, Canada. So I'm snowbound now for another couple of months probably before I can get back to work on it. but. I was just debating because there was, you know, there was a fuel leaks. There was, I could get it to idle, but then yeah. once you got on some acceleration, it would just stumble and burble and, and something's wrong, but I just. Well, something's wrong. So you start with a tune-up list and yeah. you, go, you go through the tune-up list, but sometimes, sometimes this stuff is really, really, it's really, really simple. I, I Carl Heidemann, my associate, Eclectic Motor Works, in Holland, Michigan, he had a guy come by with a either a TR or an MGB. I can't remember what. And the guy spent I make up a number twelve thousand dollars to have the engine all rebuilt, all, all this special stuff installed, and oh boy, couldn't drive it. It was it was it 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 just acted horrible. And the guy goes, "I'm sick of it. 
I want you to take this thing out and put in a V8. You know, that's a that's a fifteen thousand dollar job if you're in the shop. Nice, nice job. And Carl looks at his car and he he sees that the uh, oil cooler hose must be a B is running too close to the ignition coil. Loosens a a, gl a gland nut, moves the hose an inch. Car runs perfect. <laughs> so it may be your carburetors that are causing your problem. It may be. Yeah, I think when I get good weather, I'll start with the timing. Do your trick with the uh, the testing light to make sure the timing set right. And... Emissions, emissions. Well, there are no emissions on an MGA. Yeah. There, there most certainly are. Uh, not much, <laughs> but there's something. Emissions, engine, ignition, and fuel. Most carburetor problems are distributor problems. So just, just you know, just yeah, follow through and do it because you can you can throw an awful lot of money at this stuff. Oh yeah. And still end up with the same problem, which is so frustrating. So, okay, I'll give it a try. Thanks. All right, Elliot. Uh, Boots for my MGA, also boot day. Elliot, what are you trying to say? Something about rack boots. You know, a spoonerism is when, you, when you've got two words and you flip the initial consonant around, named after a, a radio announcer who, who mucked up something. One day, Theo Verbrugge came up and asked Lisa for rack boots, but his brain was working backwards that day and asked for root bats ever after that at our shop, ever after that. I think even on the parts box, it said root bats. So anyway, I'm not sure what uh, Elliot had in mind here. So from uh, John, he said, I had to remove the air filters from my carburetors when changing out the brake cylinder on my 72 MGB Roadster. I have new gaskets to reassemble. Do they need adhesive or, or something else? They need something else. They need grease. Just put grease on the gaskets. Don't use any, anything else on those gaskets. The, the gaskets, the manifold gasket is dry, 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 dry. But the, the carburetor gaskets that go between the manifold and the heat shield, the heat shield and the spacer blocks, the spacer blocks and the carburetors, and the air cleaner gaskets that go between the carburetors and the air cleaners, just paint them up with grease. That's all, then they'll come off next time really easily. Second question, there are two nuts that attach the brake master and clutch master cylinder housing to the firewall. They are hard to reach. Everything's hard to reach there, but you don't need, this is 72B, you don't need to take the housing loose. Just take the master cylinder out of the housing in place. You've got RD on here. I, I assume you mean Roadster and not right-hand drive. About that, I can't answer, but the brake master cylinder will come out of your car without taking the housing out. Far okay. easier, far easier. Take the kit, bleed it dry first. Otherwise that brake fluid just gets on everything. And nothing works faster than, than zip strip than, than brake fluid. Just makes a horrible mess. So anyway, get that done. Take the two lines off. There's a banjo fitting on, that comes up on an angle on the rear. Let me get rid of this picture behind me. Uh, nice carburetors on there. Just a second. Um, get rid of those and then take the, take the master cylinder cap off. And then you can, it's difficult uh, to depress the piston far enough, but you can depress the piston far enough and you can get that, that master cylinder uh, levered up and out without taking the whole bracket out. It's just so much easier. Okay. I, is, is it easier? No, it's not easier. It's less time consuming. How, how's that? So. Great. So from Chris, Chris, K-R-I-S, I've been lurking here for the last few calls. It's been a long time since we uh, talked. Thanks for doing these. Oh, Al Sater, hey Al, how you doing? So real pleasure. 
So, Al, yep, haven't seen you for a while. Nice to have you tune in. Okay, from Kurt, I've got a question about the fuel tank on my 65 MGB that has pinholes. Install a new tank or repair it? Easy, easy schmeasy. Replace it. Absolutely replace it. You can't, you, you can't fix pinholes on it. I tried one, to, you know, I tried everything. I've tried to rebuild everything on, on MGs and some Triumphs and Helix. And I had a, a fuel tank that had been missing fuel, been dry for a year, at least a year. And I dutifully got out the torch and started to heat up the top. After I brushed it all clean, I was going to tin it and solder it. I mean, that seems like a reasonable approach. Go, whoa! The gasoline, which, which had become part of the rust on the inside, suddenly with that heat vaporized. They don't just change the tank. Uh, and, uh, but keep in mind, keep in mind, Kurt, that, um, that the lip, at least on the gas tank I most recently bought, the lip uh, around the outside of it is much wider than the original, which doesn't cause any problem at all in installation, but it does cause a severe problem if you want to get the rear shackle off the right rear leaf spring. You've got to have either fingers that are about as thin as a fork turned sideways um, or, or, or grind some of that uh, lip off before you put it up there. John? Yes. This is just a tip until he can do that. Uh, and you, you did buy that insurance, right? So I can give him a recommendation that's probably lethal. If you have a pinhole leak in your fuel tank and you just want to patch it to get to when you can fix it, ivory soap. Go under there with some ivory soap and rub it back and forth across where the leak is and that'll plug it. Okay, good to know. Um, it, yeah, this is Kurt here, by the way. Um, okay, yeah, I'm not muted. Uh, so I do have another question about the fuel tank though. I the car, it's uh, an early 65, so it's got the fuel tank that has the straps that hold it up. Okay. And uh, the from trying to source a tank, Moss has one for like 250 bucks, and then all the other tanks I see are around $500. What is the what would cause the big price difference between those two tanks? And would you recommend one over the other? Oh yeah be that the expensive ones have got baffles so the gasoline doesn't slosh back and forth which makes an offensive noise when you're sitting at a at a stoplight not that you'd hear it and the other thing is it must wreak havoc with the fuel sending unit or it might be the material from which the tank is made one might be steel some kind of coated steel as the original one might be stainless I don't, I don't know, what the, but let me, let me give you some advice on the sending unit, buy the cork gasket, don't buy the, don't buy the neoprene gasket, buy the cork gasket and use Permatex number two or number three. We had a big discussion about that within the British Motor Trade Association just last week. And I said, we always used Permatex aviation number two. The last time I told somebody about it, they dropped the, the name aviation. And then one of the guys in the, on the BMTA said that, that Permatex had changed the composition and you should use number three. And then one of the other guys says, I still use number two. Anyway, number two or number three, I'm not sure, but we're close. And you paint both sides of the gasket, just gob it on and the threads of the screws, the three VA, um, three VA screws that hold it in, and that'll keep it from leaking. Perfect, sounds good. Thanks so much, John. Really appreciate you doing the uh, doing these things. Really yeah. like the Zoom meetings. Go to my website. Um, yeah. <laughs> yes. I've got a quick question. On my 80, uh, I've got to replace the gas tank because I had a little accident with a jack with it, dented it. 
And uh, I'm looking at Moss's 16 and a half gallon larger tank is with baffles. And uh, British Northwest has that same tank with no baffles, $20 less. But I'm thinking Moss's tank is probably a better tank. And I'm thinking going with the larger tank. What do you recommend? If $20 separates one tank from the other because of baffles, I'd buy the baffled tank. Right, right, that's what I thought. But would you go with the larger tank? I, I mean, at this age, look at all this white hair. We, we have to, we can't drive, you can't drive more than, more than the tank, than a 12 gallon tank holds. You gotta stop and, and um, hey. uh, seek relief. Yes, yes, thank you. Seek relief. So it just it, that's true. Uh, so I, you know, I, I don't know, and I don't, I don't know anything about those larger tanks. I, I'm, you're going to campaign. You're going to go for an ocean to ocean. You know. Well, I just well, we go to convention every other year or so. Yeah, but you stop. Yeah. You, you just stop. You know, after after a couple hours of driving, you have to stop. I know that. John, this is Jim again. Uh, yes. aesthetic, aesthetically from behind, if you're going to use that big tank, and we've installed one on a car. It sticks out about two inches from behind, so you can okay. really tell there's a gas tank in the car. Okay, right. John, while you're on, on gas tanks, uh, I don't know if the previous owner replaced the gas tank on mine, probably on my 72 MGB. It is very difficult to get fuel in the tank. And do you have any thought on what would cause, I mean, I get Bad it tank. pumped up to about a, a little over half a tank and the, the, the pump cuts off and I have to go super, super slow. Well, it has to with venting. Did we talk about that last time? If I'm rehashing, I'm sorry. Yeah, besides the white hair and the not being able to drive more than 200 miles without having to get, get out, we can't remember what we talked about. I don't remember talking <laughs> about this. Um, so yeah, it's like maybe it, it fuel backs up into the filler tube, and I don't know whether there's a vent not working or that would be my guess. Or in in and just because I mean, not every, they aren't making a hundred thousand of these tanks a day. They're not being made on machine. On they've got to be a lot of hand work in these things. So somebody got something in there wrong. I don't I don't know. There's thanks. Sorry, I, I, that's just some guesses, you know. So, John. Yes. Uh, it's Bob and Gloria Cook from Strongsville. Yeah. I want to, it's been a while since I've seen you, um, but I want to weigh in on the 16 gallon tank. I put yeah. one in my B last, last year and I love it. And we, during the COVID, we'd go, when the weather was nice, we'd take a, uh, just a ride for a whole day driving. 400 miles without having to stop, it was great. I didn't have to get gas till I got home. And uh, yeah, I am old, but I can still drive, uh, you know, four or 500 miles, but- uh, Do you have any bladder advice for the rest of us? <laughs> <laughs> Don't drink a lot. And, and we got 488,000 miles on the car, so we travel some distance. Yeah, okay. And, uh, but I love that 16 gallon tank. It does stick down, you're right, it sticks down a little bit which worried me, but it doesn't go down below the, the, the differential or anything. So I don't think it's a safety matter. And, it, and of course it's easy to install. And I, I'm really glad we did that. It's always nice to, to get a balance. So John, with the uh, back, with the back full on the, uh, when, when, you, when you fill the tank, uh, I, friends of mine have cars. I have cars that it, it does it too. And I, I think it's, where we're in New Jersey and they have these uh, rubber uh, things on the uh, a rubber uh, for, for venting for yeah uh, no on the uh, on the pump they have a you know, they, you've seen them when you've been out here yeah and I think that they're I think that every time I fill the car I've got a problem I fill it myself I don't, I don't let the attendant touch it. Uh, but uh, I, I think that it's it's a problem with the old car with the new technology on those pumps. But I wrong. Hello, John. Yes. 
Hi, this is Walter. A um, couple of things that I've seen the tanks not be able to fill a replacement tank because the um, the flange where the hose is screwed to on the on the tank itself yes um, is put too far into the tank. It's okay. soldered too far in, so it's halfway down into the tank. Um, you'll only be able to fill it up until that lip. Okay. Because um, there's no place to vent. Um, and the other thing with the tanks, with the, um, the 16 gallon tanks, uh, I was looking at a friend's car and his floor jack wouldn't fit under the tank um, to jack up the differential. Um, so I, I'm, not, I wasn't, I'm not too keen on that tank. Okay, well there's, there's pluses and minuses. So if yeah. you're worried about backing into something, <clears throat> It's hanging down there waiting, or if George gets sloppy with his jack again, it's like, you know, it's like, oh my gosh, you know, so, yeah. You know, I, I just, um, I just replaced two tanks recently, and the guy that I rent from said, well, we can't throw them in the trash as gas tanks. I'll crush them with my tractor first, and he's got a big tractor. He can't crush them. There's, there's, they're made out of some really durable steel, those original tanks. That's just an aside. Let's go. I'm gonna mute everybody here and we're gonna to go to Peter McCarthy, who says, should I rebuild my own HS2 midget carburetors or send them to Joe Curto? It ran when parked five years ago. It's been 50 years since I did know how to adjust and fiddle with them. So, should you rebuild your own carburetors? I, you know, if if they need shafts, and they almost always do. That's something you really can't do at home. I, I don't want to tell you that you can't do something, but it's difficult. You need a piloted reamer and mandrels. You know, that you don't you don't have those, so you take them to a machine shop and there's 300 bucks. Nice job, but it's really expensive. So for that kind of stuff, so there's there are people around who can who can rebush the carburetors if they need it uh, and you can buy the kit you can you can do it yourself the, the shafts wear much more quickly than the bodies do so even new shafts in an old body even though they're still a little loose are better than the old shaft so you can do all this stuff yourself that's the nicest thing about our cars you know, if you want it done absolutely correctly then you take your take your upholstery kit and you go to drop it off at the upholstery shop and have them do it i mean it's easy and take your shock i would tell anyone that they can't rebuild their own shock but um su's engines gearboxes differentials you can uh, u joints you can do all, all that stuff yourself depending on your skill level so john this is dave brown again yes the nice thing about the HS2 is that they did not put bushings in the castings when they made those little carburetors. They do not hardly ever need to be rebushed. I bet I've only done one pair rebushed in five years. And so if he wants to tackle them, he can, chances are he can fit those little shafts and he won't have enough uh, leakage there to worry about. Okay. So. I'd say he should try it. And, and if he has problems, he should uh, give me a shout and, and we can talk about it. Absolutely. Okay, so now we're going to Randy from Virginia who says prestige auto tops and carpet. We heard of that before, but okay. And Pete Masson, how do you adjust the engine restraint rod on the gearbox mounts? So Pete, you've got a 74 through 80 MGB? Correct, it's a, uh, a 77. Okay, so once everything's all in place, everything's all set, then you take that rod that comes off the bracket, goes between the engine and gearbox. Mm -hmm. You've got the two nuts, You've got the two plates, you've got the two rubber pieces, and you just tighten them up against each other until they're snug. Don't force the engine fore or aft. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Appreciate it. 
You're welcome. Rob, who's got a 72 GT with a navy blue interior, but no carpets. Were they yep. navy blue or black? That uh, you're asking about the the um, carpet color. Yeah. Probably it was probably not ochre. What's the what's the other what's the other carpet color? Uh, not autumn leaf. I, I don't know. Mine mine is a it's blaze color, but like the door panels, the seats. Um, are all uh, are all the navy blue color and when i got my certificate uh it says that the interior is navy blue but there's no carpets in it at all but uh i, I noticed even from moss any place i look at all the carpets that i can get as replacements are black that's the only color only color you want for one big reason, and that is that your feet will drag everything that's on your garage floor. And what's on your garage floor? If you've got an empty oil. Yeah. Right here, I'm sorry, I, I got a mute because we got some background noise here, but um, black, black carpeting, always. We had, you know, we'd have customers that say, oh, I want the, you know, I want the tan seats. Uh, Victoria British had some really nice interior stuff. I want the tan seats. I want the tan carpet. I want the tan, I want the tan fabric top, canvas top. It's like, okay, but understand that it will never be clean, especially those tops. Oh my gosh, if you think about it, they get a fingerprint on them. If you put your fingerprint on, if you put your finger on it, they get a handprint on them. And if you put your hand on them, they're like filthy dirty. You have to carry around, oh, what do we have in the shop? It was a carpet cleaner, it was a dry carpet cleaner. You'd shake it on with a brush and scrub it off. Oh, I can't remember this. We had a shop all the time. I'm gonna mute everybody again, I'm sorry, because we got some background noise here. And, okay, um, resolve, was that, anyway, you don't want anything but black carpeting because it just looks so awful. Now, uh, okay. Yeah, no, I was just wondering because the navy blue is very, very, very dark, you know, and I, and I just I noticed remember. that, yeah, none of the replacement carpets, they have it. It's always I black. I don't remember. I don't remember anything other than black and um, autumn leaf and tan. Okay. Okay. Hey, just, I was just, just wondering. Just to because, stay, John. You know. Yes. Um, John, I have the same blaze um, and with in it. And from uh, England, it told me that it had a navy or blue interior, had black carpets. And okay. um, that's just the way they, they brought them. It was blaze with blue, black okay. carpets, period. OK. OK. All right. I'm going to go with that then. Thanks. All right, so you can convince somebody that, that, that it's original. Hey, hey, John. Yes. Yeah, this is Kurt. Yeah. I just, um, wanted, I just wanted to let Rob know, I've gotten that carpet and that through Prestige also. And Prestige does have for the GT, not for the Bs, but the BGT, they do have a navy blue carpet. So whether it was original or they just okay. had it, I don't know, but they do have one. Okay. Yeah, mine mine is a, a BGT. Yeah. Okay. It is a GT. Yeah. Yeah, they do list the navy blue carpet for a BGT. We we we've been getting a lot of hits on prestige carpet here. It's okay. A, All right. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. From uh, Matthew. I've got a 69 midget with a starting problem, too long to type. If you let me on, I'll explain. All right, so we haven't had much action. I used to have some T-type guys come on and they say, ah, you know, you never talked about T-types. It's like, well, so ask a question. Although uh, there's still 51 messages left on chat. That I doubt we're gonna get all the way through them. Anyway, Matthew, if you're still on, you got your 69 midget, get a starting problem, talk to us. 
Yeah, I'm still on. Thanks for uh, getting to me. So yeah, I've got a I've got a 1969 midget. Um, put in a new battery and a new starter in it when I bought it. Um, started up fine, ran for three four months, uh, then came out and, and tried to start it, and it would it would attempt to crank over, you know, like four or five good like v v v. And then the next time you would try, it'd be a little bit less. Next time, a little bit less. Next time, flat. Okay. I, 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 my brain went to battery, um, brought the battery back to where I bought it. They tested it. They said it was fine. Brought the starter back to where I bought it, tested it. They said it was fine. Uh, replaced the starter solenoid and still with the same, same issue. Um, and I just recently pulled the the starter again, and it looked like some of the teeth on the on the throw were chewed up, and it was also kind of binding. So I was wondering if that would be something that would would cause it to have to, like not be able to start. I guess about the only thing left is you've got to have a full charge on on the battery. You got to have a full charge on on the battery. There's no way to assure yourself you got a full charge unless you put a hydrometer in there and and and, uh, and check the specific gravity to make sure it's fully charged. There's no other real way to tell. Then or put a battery charger on it for a while and just make sure that it's charged up. A real common thing, especially on the midgets is a failure to get a complete circuit. That is that the battery is grounded to the frame of the car. The frame of the car in turn is with a strap down by the slave cylinder that connects the frame of the car to the, to the engine. And then the engine, of course, with the, with the starter motor has a cable that goes up to the starter solenoid. So it's really common to have a voltage drop because of a bad connection. And that can evidence itself in the way that you've explained it here. Um, and I definitely, I was noticing a voltage drop when I did a, when I put a voltage meter on starting it, uh, at the starter side of the solenoid, it would be at nine volts. Okay, well, there's, there's a lot of current that runs through, through there, but what I'm talking about is, is the, the cables that are, can you, what have you got available to you? Do you have a, a voltmeter available to you? Yeah, yeah. I, test light? I like test lights because they're stupid simple, but if you've got a voltmeter, then take your voltmeter and go from the engine block, something on the engine block, like a valve cover, the valve cover nut, to the center of the post, on the negative terminal of the battery. You're going yep. from ground to ground. Okay? And I did that. I saw, I saw your YouTube video. Oh. <laughs> and, all right. And you, and you got a voltage drop there of 0.2 volts or something? Yeah, it was 0.2. Then that's not the problem. You can do it on the other side. You can go from the center of the positive post to the lug on the starter motor. Now, when you do that, you're going to get battery voltage because you're going from, from hot, the hot side of the battery down to the starter motor, and the starter motor is trying to run with whatever current it can get through your meter, which is none. So you're going to have a full battery. It should be around 13, 13, 2 volts when you do that. But as soon as you hit the starter switch and start to spin it over, then the voltage drop should again be about 0.2. So you can check the positive side. That checks the connection from the post to the clamp, the clamp to the, to the wire, the wire to the solenoid, across the solenoid, all those connections. Okay. If it's I, I, yeah, and I did that and, and, it, and it also it was reading the 0.2. Okay, so now, we're at, we always try to do the cheapest, least expensive things first. Now you bring up your car that you trust, that you carry your baby in, and, <laughs> and risk that with a long pair of good jumper cables. 
and go positive to positive, negative to negative, and then try it. If the starter motor spins over, it's because there's something wrong with the battery in the midget, because now it's running off the other car, or at least partly. If it's still the same problem, it's the starter motor. It's really hard to test a starter motor because well, how, do you, how do you test it? Yeah, it spins over. I can listen to one, I can watch it and, 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 and listen to it and tell you whether it's operating correctly. Is it out of the car again, your, your starter motor? Yeah, so I actually just pulled it yesterday because I had some people over looking at it and that's kind of also when I noticed some of the teeth look so, like-, like Tomorrow, maybe in the afternoon, uh, if it's convenient, looks like you got your hands full. <laughs> but when it's convenient, contact me and we can FaceTime. And you, okay. if you've got a long pair of jumper cables, good jumper cables, we can go off another car and I can watch your starter motor operate and maybe we can decide if, if it's good or not. Where's your old starter motor? Uh, it's in a box of old parts at my buddy's house. Okay, if it's an original starter motor with the brushes that come in from the outside rather than from the end, if, they, if, it, if it comes in, you can have those rebuilt, difficult. You can have those re rebuilt. You probably got a, a starter generator alternator shop around someplace close by. The new ones that you buy, the quality is dicey. The rebuilt ones that you buy, awful. I uh, shouldn't say all this stuff. But anyway, that's my experience is that yeah. you want to rebuild an original. Yeah. Yes. I have a question. Have we established that the charging system on his car is working well? Yes. OK. He's got I, I so I I um I pulled the the starter motor and I put it in a vice grip and and did the positive to the back of the of the starter and ground it and all that stuff and that's when I started noticing that I could get to I get to spin but every every once in a while you would touch the positive to the back of the starter and nothing nothing would happen and I would and then I would if I took my hand and I actually just spun. You know, where you the, get dead the, spots on the armature. There's something wrong with the starter motor. Yeah. Okay. That's kind of what that's uh, okay. And I was also then almost thinking the, the cost difference between the inertia one, you know, the old school and just getting a high torque uh, starter is not that much in, in money. And it seems like a, a better advanced technology. Would you, would you agree with that? I, I agree. The only downside, the two downsides of the high torque starters are they don't sound right. Who cares? Some as people. long as it starts my car. <laughs> okay. All right. Then that's not the issue. And with some installations, probably not yours because of the way the midget's set up, there, are, there can be complications like you snap the cap off the distributor in the, in the two two clips fall down and one of them hits the hot post you won't have a hot post on yours because it comes through the solenoid but there's some other installation problems i don't think on the midgets i'd go with a top with a with a high torque starter just do it you'll be okay. real, you'll be real happy perfect thank you so much okay where where are you uh, uh sacramento california how, how old is the the child in your arms uh, he is uh, seven weeks old. Oh my gosh! Oh my gosh! Yeah, my my wife let me have an early uh, midlife crisis when we found out we were pregnant with a third uh, surprise baby, uh, and so I, that's when I bought my nineteen sixty. Very cool. Very cool. Yeah. All right. Okay. Thank you very much. I'm going to mute everybody again. Da uh, just to get rid of the background noise, Lawrence Sears, with my MGA in neutral, depressing the clutch pedal reduces the idle RPM by 200. I would expect that the RPM should increase. That that's wrong. I'll explain why. Um, but anyway, it shouldn't. It shouldn't decrease. 
there's a problem with your tune-up. You know, there, there's a, there's a, a two intersecting lines. So, you know, let me see if I can do that. One, one is the energy that your engine is making, and the other one is the energy that it takes for your, for your engine to run. And that, that cross point is idle. So there's something wrong. The engine's not making as much energy as it should. The tune-up is bad. When your foot is off the clutch, the only thing more that's turning than when it's on the clutch, than when your foot's on the clutch is the gearbox. And the gearbox has got some gears in it, and it, you're throwing a lot of oil. I mean, the thing's spinning around and, and you're throwing a lot of oil around, but it's not a tremendous amount of drag. On the other hand, when you put your foot down, you've got that carbon release bearing that's pushing up against the pressure plate. It's a lot of friction. It's a lot of friction, but it should, the engine should not drop much. It's going to drop some when you depress the clutch, but not much. So there's something up with your tune-up. If you want a tune-up list on your MGA, go on my website. I don't know why I'm not sure it's there. You can email me. Just go, go through the tune-up again. There's just something, something's wrong. Timing's off a little bit. Carburetors are off a little bit or both. And you can restore that to proper running condition. And then so when you do hit the the clutch pedal, you don't get that severe decrease in RPM. So are you are you still on, Lawrence? Are you still here? Can you unmute yourself? Tell us where, where you're from. Maybe he can't unmute himself. Maybe he's already gone to bed. Um, let's see. Here we got another note here from Randy Chuck in the greater DC area. Randy gets a lot of parts from a guy in Birmingham, Alabama, Rick. So go over to the chat section. It's easier to find this stuff by time. So it's at 7.53 when Randy weighed in here with Rick in Birmingham, Alabama. And Rick's another place to buy stuff. Scott Lynn weighs in and says his midget's the same. The RPMs also drop but they shouldn't drop much. Yeah, mine's between 50 and 100, maybe. Yeah, that isn't, that isn't much, so. Okie doke, John Avalon, I had to remove the air filters. Uh, we already answered that one. Steve Kalinsky, I'm in North Jersey, Upper Saddle River looking for a fellow MGB guy to talk with as I refurbish my MGB. So if you're in New Jersey, or seems to me there's a couple other states there that abut Northern Jersey, like New York or something. But if you're up there, Steve Kalinske, would love to hear from you. Steve's got his email over here in chat at 757. So if you're interested in talking MGB and sharing, sharing beers, sharing, I'll tell you what doesn't work, and that is to go to work on his car one week and then go to work on your car the next, the both of you. You end up drinking all the time. That was always my uh, the experience that I noted from my customers who tried this. Better to work on your own car. Anyway, Judd, everybody, is spitting back through the carburetors a symptom of too lean. So my TD, when it's cold, spits unless I pull the choke out. Yes, absolutely. The reason that it, it spits because it's too lean or the timing is too retarded. It's impossible to tell when you're driving, but, and, and even when you pull the choke out, that will cover up a timing problem. But if it's just when it's cold and then it runs okay when it gets hot, yes, that's, that's the way it's supposed to work. I suspect my timing is also too retarded because I thought it was four and I was reading your timing sheet and it says 13 before top dead center at idle. That's just, a, that's not um, on a TD. That's close. Yeah. But, um, I, I set it at, at uh, either set it static at zero, like the workshop manual tells you, or put a new mark on the front pulley, one inch 
1.005 inches, one inch ahead to the right of the existing timing mark and use your, your gun, your timing light and set it maximum timing there. An idle or at high speed? An yeah. idle? No, no, you set it, um, that's 32 degrees. One inch ahead on your front pulley is 32 degrees before top dead center. In all of our cars, all of our cars, absolutely positively, except, uh, except for Jim Holiday's twin cam or anybody else's twin cam, those have got different timing specs. But all of our cars max out at 32 degrees before top dead center. It's a fixed number, 1946 through 1980, because of the construction of the cylinder head. Okay, thank you. It's, although it's important where the timing is at idle, it's not that important. What is important is that it's correct when you're asking the engine to put out as much power as it might put out driving on the highway or the expressway or something. That's where it's got to be correct. So you always, and, and the, oh my gosh, the, um, the springs are all over the place. I just talked to a guy today on the phone who said, oh yeah, I bought a brand new distributor. Uh, don't always get your old distributor rebuilt because the, that assures you that you've got the correct advanced spec in your distributor. And even if you buy a new distributor and send it to one of the distributor guys, Schlemmer or Medinsky, an advanced distributor or bridge vacuum unit, they can't, they can't work with the new distributors. So get your old distributor done. You should have, uh, what's that on the TD that you're talking about? That's a 40152 yeah. on that one. So uh, probably, and it's, it's just, it's just got to, you just, yeah. 32 at RPM at, at like 2,500 or 3,000. At maximum, at maximum advance, you, you keep revving it higher and higher and higher until the timing stops moving. That's oh. full mechanical advance. Okay. Sometimes it maxes out at 1,500 if the springs are real crappy. Sometimes you might be running 3,500, but just run it up until the, until the, time, until the timing mark stops moving, the indicated mark on the pulley stops moving. And at that point, you're at full mechanical advance, vacuum disconnected. Now you don't have to worry about that on the TD, but on all the other cars with vacuum advance, it's vacuum disconnected 32 before at full mechanical advance. Noel Harrington from Grand Rapids, he's not, Noel's not from Grand Rapids, he's from North of here, says another tip, instead of using carburetor spray, is taking a propane torch and just opening it up and holding the end of the torch down by the head and the manifold, the manifold, the heat shield, the heat shield, and the spacer box, et cetera. The only problem with, with using a torch is you really can't tell where the, the, the propane gas is going. With a carburetor cleaner, you can see it. It's a squirt. You, know, you can see it come out, out of the end. Um, but Noel's quite right. You can use a propane unlit, unlit propane torch to find the same problems there. Uh, let's see, I'm going down for, I've got some thank yous on here. Jim says, some people use lighter oil or no oil and maybe no springs to gain performance. Does that make sense? No, it doesn't. So, so what about a race car? But race cars, but, but, but race, but my friend races cars, but race car, race car. Those things are running four, four to 8,000 RPM. The carburetors are, are all but all the way open anyway. They don't have to go through that whole range of motion between uh, idle at 800 RPM and driving to the grocery store. Race car parts, as Bert Levy says, you start adding race car parts. Can I say something about this? When I first started racing TR3s, sure. I asked everybody what to use. And the hot setup, according to the guy that sold me all of his old parts for a lot of money, uh, 
was to use brake fluid in them. That was the hot trick. And then another guy Liz, would actually, Liz, Liz. he would actually break the the little plunger with the piston on it off of the thing. That was his trick. Run it without anything in it. And when you think about it, all that that does is it dampens the flutter and motion of the piston as it comes up inside the carburetor. And just like you said, on a race car, you're running, you know, either full closed or three quarters or all the way open all the time. So you don't really need that dampening function. So go with what the factory says, you know, the, oil. The factory says engine oil. Yeah. Now I'll make a case for using something a little thicker because of all the wear and the abrasion on the inside of the dash pot that's occurred in the past, count them, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80, 90 years. There's a, there's a certain amount of wear and you can, the cheap trick for getting around wear is put in some thicker oil. I like the thicker oil. Okay, let's see. Uh, if money wasn't an object, <laughs> Would I be doing this for a living? This is like going on Reddit, you know, if, if you were to die and come back as Captain Nemo, I, you know, okay, so Ryan says, if money wasn't an object, would you replace your Stromberg with dual SUs or a Makuni? I have a 1980 MGB that refuses to start when hot, and I'm thinking about changing it. Okay, well, first of all, the problem with restart is your automatic choke, probably, and the boiling fuel. So you can get out of this for a whole lot cheaper and keep your Stromberg. If I were going to do it, I would go with SUs, of course, and I'd go with HS SUs, of course, because I don't like HIFs because when they something goes wrong with them, you gotta take them off the, off the manifold. So to do this, you need an intake manifold, an exhaust manifold, a front exhaust pipe. Now you've got the best exhaust system that you can possibly buy, which is the double Y exhaust system that was used on the MGB from on, on all, the, all the cars, except when they put the Strombergs onto ours. But that, that is just the best exhaust that there is and you get SUs, it's just great. And you can use K&N filters, oh my gosh. It looks nice, it looks real. I love SUs, but if you buy a kit, I just sent one guy to a, 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 one of the suppliers and he said, what do you think that's gonna cost me? The manifolds, the front pipe, the throttle cable, the choke cable, I mean, sell me a kit. Just sell me a kit with some simple instructions. What do you think that's going to cost? And I didn't dare tell him that I thought it might cost as much as two thousand bucks. So, so anyway, uh, Makuni. I, there's lots and lots of stuff out there, but you always do the least expensive, simplest, cheapest first. Well, John, I appreciate the advice. I, I only paid three thousand dollars for the car, so yeah, if I, I if I have to spend uh, two thousand to put carburetors on it. But, this is my first MG. I've never you, you owned forgot one the before, most important so two words. I'm in the I've been the <laughs> you forgot the most important two words so far. I've only spent three thousand dollars on the car <laughs> so far. And with that, John, I have an so, appointment. I've got to get might going. Be listening. Okay. Got a quick suggestion. Yes. Is it reasonable to put a manual choke on a Stromberg car race? Yes, there is a kit. There is a kit, but that that um, that will help if there's not a problem with the automatic choke having a warped mating flange and allowing gasoline to be sucked from the float bowl up into the into the venturi. So there's there's a bunch of other stuff. So um, uh, Ryan, get in touch with me tomorrow or something or other. Call me and I'll, I'll, I'll talk you through some, some of this stuff because it's getting to be, I, I always say that the seminars are going to run for two hours, but then it's 927 and, and there's still 60, six, zero new messages. That's even a longer number if we're, if we're going in base two, but um, oh my gosh. 
Thank you so much, John. Hey, you're very welcome. So Judd put HS6 carburetors on his MGB because the HIFs are too complicated, uh, but the HS6s are just too big. They're too big. So if they're too big, then why does a Volvo B18, same engine as an MGB, if you've got a mirror in front of you, it's the same engine, it looks like the same engine, it's just reversed. Uh, why, does, why does Volvo use HS6s? You know, but if big carburetors made your car go faster, then why wouldn't you have that big a carburetor on your bug eye Sprite? Because it doesn't work. It, it, you have to have a certain amount of air going through that carburetor to evaporate the gasoline. That's the function of the carburetors to evaporate the gasoline. And the faster the air moves, the, e, the, the more efficient that evaporation works to a point. You can run an MGB with, an, with a pair of HS2s and it works great, except it won't go 80. It won't go that, it, you hit a limit. I was at the NAMGAR event in Dubuque, Iowa two years ago. Peter Caldwell, who rebuilt shocks at Worldwide Imports in Madison, Wisconsin, that's your shock man. He, has, he had a commercial vehicle, an Australian, I think it was commercial vehicle. It had a 1800 engine in it, just like our MGBs, a little bigger than our MGAs. And it had a manifold with a single, single HS2 carburetor on it, because it was just for really low speed round town use. So there's all kinds of all kinds of stuff. Anyway, it is 929, and I just I, I have I'm sorry, there's 60 messages on, on here. And I'm sorry that I couldn't get to everybody. So next time when you come on, log in earlier. I can't tell from the chat. I don't know how I save these. I, I record these. And I know there's a way to save the chat. So somebody send me an email and tell me how to save the chat. So that I'll, I, can, I can print that up too and get that on. Maybe I can get that on YouTube too. I don't, I don't know. But if I can, then people have the phone numbers that they've given out, that's what you want, is your uh, your personal phone number on YouTube. But <clears throat> it helps. There's a lot of information in that chat, chat section. So I, I want to thank everybody very, very much for being on tonight. I want to encourage you to go visit my PayPal button. I see ba uh, Barney Gaylord on here. Barney's got a, a just a kick-ass, super-duper MGA site. Although, you know, a lot of that stuff transfers over. So Barney Gaylord is the MGA guru. Uh, I want to thank uh, um, Bert Levy for coming on tonight. If you haven't bought his books, he said he'd give you five bucks off if you call him. I don't know what his phone number is, but, you know, for five bucks, maybe you can spend a couple of minutes on the internet and find his phone number and say, remember that $5 off that you offered? So, so anyway, support uh, support the trade, support people in the trade. We got one less uh, seller of parts now than we did same time last year. Um, but support these people, give them feedback. Not every part that everybody makes all the time is good. We all know that. They do the best they can. A lot of the stuff, I, a lot of the stuff comes from the same place that people who were rebuilding Model A's or Mustangs, where their parts come from, and they have the same kinds of complaints that we do about the quality of the parts. And just, if we work with each other, we'll know how to overcome some of this stuff. Anyway, thank you very, very kindly for being on tonight. If you want to unmute, you can. It gets to be loud after a while, but we can all say goodbye to each other. We still have a hundred. I never looked tonight yeah. how many people we had on. We got about 215. Holy moly. John, John at our uh, at the high high water mark was early on were 267. That's that's Guinness, that's Guinness Book of Records territory, man. Oh my gosh. 267. Hey, okay, that's 
That's the highest number that I, I've seen. So anyway, thank you very, very kindly. Every, every, somebody's got uh, a foghorn in there. <laughs> so, oh, there, there, there we go. Somebody had some feedback. Was that you, Doug? Um, no, I don't think so. Okay. All right. Anyway. Sorry. Anyway, thanks, everyone, for being on here. Barney, thanks for, for coming in. And you didn't only have one thing to say. Sometimes Barney's got more to say. I didn't, I didn't see a Tom Snook. Thank you kindly for supporting me and, and uh, hope things are nice in Florida. Ryan, good luck with your uh, with your new MGB. Thank you, sir. And call me any any of you can call me anytime. I'm happy, well, almost anytime. Happy to take your, your calls. Try to help out as best as I can, send you information as often as I can. If you really need an answer, call me. You know if you've emailed me that sometimes I, I I'm not Ann Landers. She claimed that she answered every letter that came into her office, but she had a huge operation going on. And she personally, she said she personally answered every letter. Come on. So she had to have some help, you know, or, or, or that's the only thing she did in her whole life. So anyway, thank you very, very kindly, everybody, for being here. And uh, I don't know where we have people on from. Thank today. you, John. Yep. Thank you, John. I appreciate everything. Oh, nice to see you. Haven't seen you for a couple of years. You know, see you this summer, I hope. You know. That Thanks, John. Can I can I put a plug yeah. in for um if you you're looking for a used part or parts that are NA from Moss, uh Team Triumph in Warren, Ohio. He's got a okay. web. Yeah, Scott. Scott. Our, he's a great guy, yeah. Scott. Yeah, we love Scott. Okay. And he also is a Moss distributor, but well, he's got two buildings full of used parts. And okay. Because of the COVID now, he only does mail order or sure. if you know him well enough, he'll put my parts out on the loading dock and I can go pick them up. But okay. uh, he, yeah, he's a great guy. There's there are a lot of people around that, that have a, a considerable quantity of parts. So anyway, Phil Ryan, thank you. Not nice to see you. I'll, I, I know I'll see you sometime. I haven't seen you in person for years, but um, I, if, you moved to town so you could see me, and then and then COVID came. You know, I mean, that's all right. We'll, we'll catch up in the summer. Okay, all right. So Stu Cole, nice to see you on tonight from Canada. Pleasure, pleasure to see you. John, very nice. Yep, nice. And who else? Uh, who else? So I see. Go go to another one here. I'm uh, somebody's just. Uh, no. Oh, Jim Holiday just uh, sent me Vern Notstein. Haven't seen you for a while. Vern, you say Vern, Vern and his son always came to our birthday parties, so pleasure. And and who did I see? Uh, oh, just come on. Uh, Doc Rosevear, nice to see you. So anyway, anyway, so real pleasure, and I've enjoyed this. Hope you have too. Good night, and, John. Hit that PayPal button if you, geez, you know, it's almost embarrassing. But anyway, ladies and yeah. gentlemen, thank you very kindly. And we will tune in. Uh, you get another an, another note and we'll see you then. So two weeks you. in two weeks, right? Uh, in two weeks, in two weeks or, or it's twice a month. So I, I don't I don't know. Let me look at my calendar here. Um, yeah, two weeks, the 8th. Monday's a better day than Tuesday for us. Well, it's a better day for me. <laughs> it's That's good. <laughs> okay. All right, it's Tuesday already. So. So. Okay. All right. I'm, I'm gonna hit the I'm gonna hit the goodbye button. So anyway. Okay. Good night, everyone. Thanks, Thanks very much. Bye. Thank you.